Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. If you're listening to this podcast on the day of release, it is the 80th anniversary of the bombing of Aachen on the 13th of July, 1943. Now, it wasn't the only time that Arkin was bombed. It was one of many. And to discuss that, we're joined by Dr. Philip Blood, who is a historian who has made Arkin his home and has been researching Arkin's war for a long time for an upcoming book, which we are super excited for. Now, in this podcast, we are going to be discussing many, many things. We will be discussing Dyson's bomber, the things he was trying to achieve in it, but also the environment in which he was writing that book. Into this conversation this week is going to come David Irvine, the fate of bomber crews throughout the four years of the bombing campaign on Aachen. So please be aware that we will be discussing German autopsy reports. We will be discussing the fate of those on the ground during a fire bombing. And we will also be discussing at length whether or not the strategic bombing campaign was genocidal in intent and genocide with a capital G. So it's a very long pod. I've decided not to split this one because there is too much in it for it to be taken out of context in two or three parts. So with that in mind, we're not going to hold back anymore and we're just going to dive straight into this one. So let's start with Dyson and start delving into that. Now, from your perspective, as you said, as a German historian and the the wider context of his work and bomber in particular what is your viewpoint on the work today versus how say those of us here in the uk would be looking at it well i think there's um a large part of um german scholarship which has attended to ever since the 90s when they uh, started to address the subject in a more scholarly fashion rather than jerking towards, you know, responding to, uh, well, Arkham had been bombed, so let's have a book about Arkham being bombed, or Dresden had been bombed, so let's have a book about Dresden being bombed. The, the German academics started to consider a slightly more nuanced view of the war, and there was the uh, German history of the Second World War, produced by the Potsdam historians. And I believe the man's name is Hans Boog, and he kind of relied on a lot of the literature that was available, but as archives became accessible. So what you find in the German, early German writings, sad to say, is references to David Irving. Ah. So I put it down to three things. One, that Irving is regarded up until the trial as an acceptable historian. I mean, not to me and not to many others, but there was a view that he was a respectable historian and several leading historians claimed he was um, of a, an excellent researcher. Um, that wasn't my opinion, and I've never held to that. Uh, and, and when asked about how would I approach dealing with Irving, I said, double check his literature. Because if it's translated, it's just translated. It's not research, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yes. So the other thing was um, the East German side of things became prominent um, because Dresden was the key. And so Dresden was this huge horror that the Soviets and the East German communists would use to batter uh, Western propaganda uh, during the period up until the end of the Cold War, when, of course, we know as the war came down and everything smoothed away, there was what was left. Now, Actually, having gone in 1983 to Dresden and seen the scale of the damage, <laughs> I must admit, I was I was staggered. Um, the lady in the hotel um, 
the manager said to me and my friends, uh, there were three of us at that stage, uh, an East German and um, from Berlin and a friend of mine from London, uh, said to us, don't walk around speaking English uh, because you'll get lynched. Wow. Um, actually, we found if we met students, we they wanted us to speak English. Um, but one Saturday morning, I did actually walk in the ruins of the Frauenkirche and many of the other places like the Zwinga, which was still in rubble. And I hadn't seen anything to that extent. I'd seen damage in the 60s in Manchester when you walk through certain parts like Manchester Victoria Station, a lot of the roof was still missing from where the bombing was. And my grandparents would always say, oh, look, this is where the bombing was. And my grandfather was on fire duty that night on the Blitz. So it was always a constant conversation, but I never saw anything quite like the destruction I saw in Dresden. So Irving used that as a platform to beat people around the head with and hit people's consciousness. So if you were Dayton in 70, you've got Irving giving it large on Dresden and um, you've got what's going on in the Vietnam War and you've got what's going on in West Germany, um, where the cities are trying to not so much erase that history, but trying to move on. I mean, if you know W.G. Siebald, he, he wrote about how the, the 1945 landscape became the norm and, the, and society had moved on. So the people of, so like the people of Arken, I mean, it sounds strange. We're, we're, we're digging deep before we even started this thing, really. I'm, um, I'm, I'm not surprised that's happening, Phil. <laughs> but if you were... See, I remember going to Ludwigshafen and Mannheim at a time when the people there were still mis visiting the mass graves from the bombing um, on a Sunday. And there would be the trams full of ladies in black and others uh, going to see the dead, uh, you know, the, the mass graves. So I, I, I have seen that. Um, but Dresden was a lot different. Um, it was almost like they took pride in the ruins as their existence. Mm. And when you spoke to students they were not so much hostile at my generation. They were very hostile about my father's, my grandparents' generation and felt they were war criminals. And it was the first time I'd ever heard, okay, I read, it, I read the odd thing, but the first time I'd actually heard it voiced, the Royal Air Force were terror flieger. Mm -hmm. you know? They were terrorists in the air. So my experience at Dresden was quite, I wouldn't say shocking. It was just surprised. I hadn't seen the extent, you know, to to look to look towards maybe a kilo, kilometer, two kilometers, and nothing but destruction and damage and waste and emptiness and soulless buildings. That's stunning. Uh, and when you look at what Dresden was, and then you stand at the point of the railway station and you look straight down the main corridor. And it's just concrete blocks because the whole area has been completely demolished. Um, that, that that was soulless, <laughs> soulless horror. So I could understand why David Irving could play on that. He could do that, and he, he you know, he could twist those facts. Um, now I'm more attuned to the East German logic about how they were treated. And how that attitude of, you know, I think you mentioned Stasiland as a book that you particularly like. The East Germany wasn't as it was portrayed. It was um, people a lot more sociable than, you know, the idea that somehow this was part of some Stalinist plot to take over the world. That People just got on with their lives. And the Russian soldiers, I, I only ever actually saw Russian soldiers angry once, and that was on that Saturday morning when I went across the bridge to continue looking at the, the extent of the damage. And once you cross the bridge into Dresden Neustadt, you got into the old buildings because they hadn't burnt. So you could see what, well, you got an impression of what Dresden was like. And I'm walking down the streets trying to look at the buildings because like, that's what you do. 
and five Russian soldiers were beating up two Germans. I mean, the Russians were very drunk, uh, and they were calling them Nazis in some kind of you know Russian form. And it was the first time I'd actually experienced the sense of occupation. Up to that stage, I hadn't ever. And I'd been to East Germany and Poland quite a few times by that stage, and that was a shock. Um, so, yeah, um, what then came out of round about the time of 1997, 96, somewhere around there. Just, just before we dive in there, people do see Irvine now through that lens of the trial, you know, the subsequent movie about it, things like that. The, the thing that I always pick up on as a Vonnegut fan, for example, is the specific mention of Vonnegut of him using Irvine as a source for the his I'm doing air quotes here, everybody. The historical bit of Slaughterhouse Five. Do you do you think those the the fictions that came around that used Irving as a source, Dighton, Vonnegut, things like that, have probably played uh, tangentially more into the consciousness than the actual work Irving did. <laughs> mm. Okay, I'm going to answer you with a question. <laughs> How much of the narrative of the Second World War is still flooded with Irving's nonsense? Knowing you, I'm going to say a lot. So, for example, the war between the Allied generals, Mm -hmm. did you know he wrote that story? He did. And do you know he was behind a lot of that? And that hasn't gone away? So for things like that that he he created we'll call them storm, storms and teacups that have just exploded out since then. The, the, well, I mean, you, you look at, I mean, I actually went to one of his lectures when his book first came out and I couldn't believe what I was listening. And this was 1976 and we were all told during our A-levels to go and listen to this dude. And um, my uncle had been in Belson, right? And along along with a lot of other trade trade unionists and politicians, they were taken there because, believe it or not, in 1945, there was a lot of people in this country, in Britain especially, um, suggesting that Nazis hadn't committed these crimes. So, well, I think it was Hitchcock was making the films. Um, I think it was Hitchcock. I always forget all these directors. But while the ma- the films were being made, there were actually all these politicians going around watching what, what had actually happened and studying what was going on. And my great uncle had gone along on that. And um, Irving had said that Hitler didn't know all of this was going on. <laughs> so, you know, as you do, you put your hand up and say, Oi, twat. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, my uncle was in Belson. And saw all of this. He straight away his response to me was, "Well, your uncle was a liar." So I knew then, you know, that was my first confrontation with the guy, and I, it was never ever going to work afterwards. Although quite a few of my esteemed colleagues in academia once suggested that I was a friend of his, <laughs> <laughs> which you know, as a former chairman of the Anti-Nazi League, I find quite amusing, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't stand the guy or any of his mates. And he tried to pull stunts of bullying people, and nobody sees this. Uh, his record of bullying people was outrageous. Um, and he still, I think he still does it. I mean, I've just got no time for him. But if you go into the 90s, Germans start looking at the crimes that Germany's committed and at the same time kind of teasing what's been going on. Not so much that Germans are victims, um, but maybe there's another way of looking at, at, at the bombing. And that's when you get books like W.G. Seagull's book, uh, Siebel's book, and um, there's another chap called Sus. And then, of course, <laughs> you get Jörg Friedrich's book, The Brand, the, Brand, the uh, Firestorm which causes no end of mayhem in academic circles by suggesting that, 
you know, every British and American bomber pilot and bomber crew was a genocidal maniac. And um, that was like the other shift. Mm -hmm. So you've gone from one shift to another shift. Um, I think we're a little bit more settled down now. Um, I think people are beginning to, you know, there's been some very good books like uh, Bones and Ruins by David Crew and Igor Primovitz's book on the bombing. And there's been groups surrounding um, Richard Overy and Richard Overy's work on the bombing. But there's still elements to the story which I don't think we've developed. And I know you and I, we've had discussions about, for example, the falsifications that underpinned the bombing surveys by both the British and the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and none of those have served anybody any good, really. Um, and we've all assumed that because the surveys were done to learn about the bombing, we've accepted that those, those that they were truthful. Um, actually, they were self-serving exercises for everybody to get more medals and more appreciation of themselves, which, you know, nasty. Yeah, and it, it, it's, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about the butt report and the changes that came afterwards, but they had to prove that the changes were working. And we, we, we've all... <laughs> We've all written reports for our bosses that put our put our efforts in good light, and it's um, it's a that's we're saving that for another podcast, Phil, we, which we will have to do together with a, yeah. a, a, a I mean, bottle of something it, with us. I think the thing I would say at this stage, before we get into the raid, is you've got a you've got a scenario where hindsight is rewriting combat reports. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So. You've had the war, you've had the battle, you've had the raid, you've had the exercise. Um, you've written a report to say that this will happen during the raid. That hasn't happened. So you then rewrite the report to say, well, actually, we didn't quite get that, but we got this instead. And all the way through with, you know, working on this subject, it's always been a case of two steps forward and five back. Those steps back... Are this is probably going to be a silly question, but are they getting smaller steps back? Or are they the same sort of leaps back that have been, have been there in the past? Because, you know, as you're saying, there's these tendrils of that work that the likes of Irvine did in things in the 60s that are still with us. We've got an interesting time now when we discuss the bombing campaign, something we're going to come to later um, around how it should be framed and how we should view it that there's it almost seems like a, a binary response oh you can't say that because because of what you know what they did to us do you think those steps in the progress forward to having a better understanding of it um, are still dragging us further back than the progress i think there's two problems um I think one of the biggest problems has happened since um, British exceptionalism has become something quite unpleasant um, and it's filtered into military history. And I think military history is becoming more and more increasingly distant from reality. Um, and that's why I perhaps make this comment now that I'm a, more of a cultural military historian rather than a military historian in the tr traditional sense. I think what's actually happened is, and, and, you know, I know the guys are going to say that I'm picking on them, but I'm not. But I do make this comment constantly that obsolete air, aircraft should be outed as obsolete. Mm. And I, don't, I know James hates it when I attack the Blenheim. But my argument isn't that you're saving the aircraft. You're actually preventing that story ever from occurring again. Because what you actually get in the history of the Blenheim is that the crews get in the airplanes and fly the plane and die, right? Yeah. They fly because that's all they've got. My question is, why did they have that in the first place? Why didn't people just stand up and say no? No, no, no. And, of course, all the way through since 1940, Britain has put forward this idea that we make do. We make do with this, we make do with that. 
and, and you know, lately it's make do with the F-35, which, you know, to me is a crock of shit. But I, I, I knew I liked you. <laughs> so, you know, and where do I come from all of this? Well, I come from Avros because my dad was a big Avros man, as you mm-hmm. know, he worked on the Balkan. And I all my youth was, would have been, going into aircraft engineering. I'm sure of it. Um, Dad said, you know, I kept training you with the compasses and the slide rules and all the rest of it. TSR2 comes along and all of that ends. Yeah, the whole the whole kit and caboodle, everything stops. British aviation literally goes down the toilet, blah, blah, blah. But all along, if you ever met anybody who talked about those aircraft back in the day, they said, why the hell did we end up with those? Why did we have fairy battles? Well, you got fairy battles because there was not enough money going into production, into design, and into into building what Britain really needed. So they ended up, the air crews were given this pile of junk and then told to go out and, and, and fly missions, which, you know, we can talk about the 1940 missions over Arkham, which are utterly unrealistic. Mm. And I've read the battle instructions, and I've read the combat instructions, and I've read the orders, and I've seen the aircraft that they're trying to do this with. <laughs> Somewhere there's just no reality. You, you, you've got instructions which suggest, oh, well, you know, go and destroy the whole of the Roar with a few Hamdens, a few Whitleys, the odd Wellington, and maybe a fairy battle. Please, how are you going to do that? It, the, 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 I mean, the best has got to be the Ems Canal. The Dortmund Ems Canal. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> You're going to bomb it with hand grenades. Well, that's that's, <laughs> that's really going to be... No, no. So what you have to say is in the history, it's not that there is an exceptionalism and that these aircraft was great and the aircraft were great and the people were great and blah. You've got to turn around and say, no, it was shit. And it's still that attitude which goes into the procurement of weapons such that British soldiers today are going to war or will be going to war with junk and rubbish. Well, how is that acceptable? That cannot be acceptable. It, you know, so there. <laughs> I'm going to let that one hang I because I, I think that's, that's also an, another another podcast i i i think we've had this discussion it's 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 believing in a theory so much you forget about the tools you know this 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 idea of strategic bombing which is even you know if if, if you look at say when the tools were in place in in the 60s and, and you look at how um we're well off track now ladies and gentlemen when you're looking at the 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 use of say the the B-52s over Vietnam, where even with that level of striking power, they're still flattening trees left, right, and center, and still claiming results. It doesn't move on. The theory still stays beyond what the capability is. And I think and I think in that that sort of middle 30s, where you know your your lots at Avro are, are desperately trying to to move forward with, with Manchester with that um Interesting engine choice um, that then leads to Lancaster. They they never have the time to stop and actually realise what they're doing isn't working. No, and and in this you get historians who misread stuff and tell odd stories. I mean, the thing that I discovered a long, long time ago was that the the Lancaster was not born out of Manchester by sticking four engines on it. And that's simply because, and, and people who work in aircraft design know, it all comes down to the number of jigs you're using. And the Manchester was about 750 jigs, and the Lancaster was 1,849. And that is a different aeroplane. Mm-hmm. It's a very, very different aeroplane. And Roy Chadwick wrote an article for Flight Magazine in 1942, in August 1942, in which he explained in great detail why the two aircraft were different. If Roy Chadwick <laughs> doesn't know what he's designed, how can historians know better 80 years later? And yet still you never see that being 
examined. So, you know, I mean, okay, we're way off track now. So we're talking about the design of a Lancus and we haven't even gone past the hand. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh... <laughs> it's you. You lead me astray. I, I, I know. That that's why we've started this one early, so I know we can go for a while if we need to. Uh, the edit's going to be fun. Um, let, let's let's try to grab this thing by the nose and, and, and drag it. Drag it back towards... Um, where we started <laughs> um we we have we have this fractured lens that we're looking through and and seeing these different perspectives with with the work that's coming in germany you're saying that, that you know the, the pendulum swings in all these interesting sort of ways but how when we start seeing you know y- you made an interesting point before how you feel that the way we look at bomber and and, and the radio played isn't an accurate reflection of, of of what a raid would have been inflicting. Now, when we start looking at the raids on Arkin, which start, as you said, right from the beginning all the way through until the city falls, what is going on in Arkin while the RAF are essentially using it as a, a testing range to figure out what the hell they're doing? Okay, so you start with Arkin. Let's start with Arkin, then 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 do the bombing. So. Well, the, I think the the book it's Alfelt. Crayfelt is the target, and, Cray, and they hit Crayfelt and, and Alton something. El Garden. El Garden, that's it. And but on the radio, they change the date, and they go to the eighteenth of February, nineteen forty-three. Is that right? Yes. So they have a false date in the book. Date has a false date. But the radio show has an actual date. I, th- I think the difference was there was no Saturday the 18th of February in 43, and I think that's how they worked it. But, yeah. Right. Because the date they used was a raid on Wilhelmshaven. Okay. And that's quite interesting um, because um, it kind of breaks away from Dayton's idea. Dayton wanted a completely soulless thing. And if you and I'm going to talk about him just for a second mm. before we get into Arkham, because there's there's certain things that are important about him. And I asked myself before I came here, what was he actually looking for? And this is why it's important to, as I use this to proceed before we get to Arkham. And I th- thought there were four points behind his book. One is ritual. One is the comparisons, the underlying comparisons with Vietnam. Um, one is the concept of the last full measure, you know, the forlorn hope in war, mm-hmm. the last the last line, and then the purity of mechanized conflict. Um, if you look at two uh, two sentences he writes before he actually gets into his book, he said, I wanted to emphasize the dehumanizing effect of mechanical warfare. So that's one thing, mechanical warfare, underlined. The other is, I like machines, but in war, all humans are their victims. So the other word is victims. So you've got mechanical warfare on one side, you've got victims on the other. If you look at what he does to create his book based on his sources, he's got Franklin and Webster, the official history of the bombing. He's got Franklin's Bomber Offensive from 1968. He has memorabilia, interviews, and great assistance from the Imperial War Museum. Okay. So I'm going to just interject one little thing there. Richard Holmes says, said to me, never trust interviews, hmm. especially interviews over 30 years. They're just they're useless. Great to hear, great to engage with, but for a historian deadly okay so 30 years after the event um dayton is using interview and opinion now i've tracked a couple of his things so let's let's just go where he talks about the the german towns and the german cities so i'm going to talk to you now about arken now Arkan in 1919 is a city in complete distress. Um, the German armies um, marched through it and then abandoned it. 
and the city was then occupied by the French, <clears throat> and then it was occupied by the Belgians. Now, if you took Arken on its own, you'd think, well, just a city where there was four hospitals. Okay, Edith Cavell was a prisoner in one of the seven prison camps that were there for aliens and for prisoners of war. Um, it also was the transition point for prisoner swaps between the British and the Germans. Um, it was actually, if you look harder, it was intending to combine with Brussels to create a super metrop metropolis. Really? Which very few people have ever picked up on. And so the Belgians came with a view to getting revenge for everything that the Germans had done to them. Um, so you've got a state which, for the next 10 years, is occupied by the Belgians. Okay. Now, between 1900 and 1932, you'd think, well, there's going to be a sharp rise towards right-wing politics. Well, there wasn't. Uh, in 1900, 90% of the population was Catholic centrist. Um, those numbers stay fairly static until um, you get the Great Crash and you see the Nazis coming along. But the Nazis never reach more than 20% of the population in vote. And when Hindenburg stands against Hitler, um, Hindenburg get, gets round about 75% of the vote. Hitler gets 17 and the rest are abstentions. Um, so Nazism is forced on, on Arkin, in a sense, in 1933. <laughs> and they can't, the Arkaners, you know, they have their own dialect, Osher, and they, <laughs> they they don't do as they're told quite often. You, um, you must um, fit in fabulously there, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at home. And um, so come the election in 1933, the big plebiscite, and, you know, we some states are giving the Nazis 90%. Um <laughs> Arken was still giving the centrists 45% of the vote and refused to give Hitler any kind of mandate whatsoever. He got 22% uh, of the vote, the communists and the SPD filling it all up. So you've got, <laughs> you've got a state which said, basically, Hitler, you can get lost. Um, and it was never really, it was never really going to be a, a big winner when the, the Nazis were so anti-Catholic. So what you find happening is that the Nazis bring in outsiders to run the Nazi clique. And um, it's the Schmier family, uh, Rudolf, Eduard, and another one. I'm always forgetting his name. Um, and they join up with a guy called Quirum Jansen, and they run the city. And the city then falls under the Gau or the Gau Leiter of Arken and Cologne, a guy called Josef Grauer. And he's another outsider. He comes from Rhineland Faust or somewhere. Um, but what's significant about what happens in the Arken area and this in this area we call the Eiffel, which is the tip of the Ardennes? Um, in 1933-34, the, the Nazis open up a university out in the in the uh, na national park there now, and it's a na these Nazi universities are placed all over Germany, but this one is there to confront Catholicism. So you've actually got in a city like Aachen an uh, an ideological battle between religious orthodoxy, Catholicism, very mainstream. Um, monotonism, which is, you know, belief in the Pope, Pope's word is sacred, versus the Nazis, where Hitler's sacred. So, you know, lots of reasons why Hitler isn't going to visit Hit Aachen anytime, because it's not a city that he's interested in. Also, Charlemagne, who famous Karl der Grosse, killed all the um, Saxon 
chieftains back in the day. And because Hitler's nationalism, no, German national status went through Saxony, <laughs> he thought Charlemagne was a shit. <laughs> so so for, on two counts. So the city becomes a Goering place. Okay. So Goering's very influential here. And then the SS move in and they do their thing. Um, you, you have confrontations all the way through with religion. Um, the cardinal or bishop I can always get those kind of religious titles wrong. They, they both they both got big hats. No, but yeah, but they, it shifts and changes all the time, and I always forget which is which. But anyway, um, one of these chaps uh, makes an announcement that you can be a good Catholic and support the Führer, and then six months later. You have uh, the famous Kristallnacht when um, they, the the synagogue is destroyed in Aachen. It was a very famous ornamental almost synagogue which had been built in 1860s. Um, it was burnt down. The fire brigade very famously um, fueled it so that the flames would increase. They ran indoors, opened up the top of the roof so the flames could shoot through. They created a bonfire. Um, the Gestapo were very quick to steal the ingredients, you know, the, the goodies, the scrolls, the monies, all that stuff. Um, and then, then the war starts. And for Arkan, it's like, wow, we're getting all our territories lost from 1919. Because in, when Versailles was imposed on the Arkan area, Lots of areas like Oipen and Malmedy, which had fallen into its kind of control and part of the railway line from Aachen down to Malmedy and further down to Luxembourg. Um, these have been cut off. And even though there have been local plebiscites to stay within German control, uh, they've been taken out. And um, the locals were very pleased to get back and they waved the German army coming through and all the rest of it, 1940. Now, the first Jews have been deported from Aachen um, in 1941. Up until that stage, between 1938 and 1941, they're in, housed in specific ghettos. Now, just, just to ask, Phil, for a city that was Catholic centrist, that shift towards Kristallnacht, then the de deportation, deportations how, how how is that managed is that just inevitability or is that action on the ground under under Goering and the cronies that he's putting in place to to, to make the city more nazified um Aachen actually had a trial on this which is unlike any of the german cities uh, the british imposed a trial in 1947 as far as they could understand um, Quirin Janssen, who was the Oberbürgermeister of the city, he was with Heydrichs that morning um, and apparently didn't get the orders from Goebbels. Um, so he escaped trial, but the rest of them were all um, imprisoned. Um, how it worked? Well, there was a phone call. The SS and the SR that night on the 9th of November was celebrating um, various aspects of German national history. I'm not going, going into too much detail, but they were all in the main square in Aachen and there had been a huge parade, which was the induction for the SR and the SS. These guys were all in place. And then um, there was the call. The Gestapo were the first to move with the border police into the synagogue to rob the place. Then the SR and the SS men were taken to a, a police precinct nearby to the synagogue and told to wear civilian clothes, so they had to take off all their uniforms. The fire brigade by that stage was under the SS control, so they took their uniforms off, but they were not a city fire brigade unit. They were from outside. The trucks to... Uh, steal the um, swag from the from the shops and from the synagogue 
were actually farm trucks that were brought into the area by the National Socialist Motor Corps and parked just round the corner from the synagogue in preparation. So the process was quite fast. It was all Nazi. There is evidence that afterwards some people walked the streets smashing Jewish windows and, you know, that's where you get the crystal night thing. Um, there is no evidence that there were masses of people out in the streets at one one thirty to 2 o'clock in the morning when this happened. If you read the trial papers, the, the evidence suggests that the, the synagogue was virtually burnt out by the time people were waking up at 9 o'clock to go to work. And funnily enough, the metro, meteorological society kept a record of the clouds that were coming over because it was unusual and they were just keeping a record of what was going on in the air and by 10 o'clock the clouds had gone the smoke clouds had disappeared um one of the one of the chiefs of police was famous because um infamous because he later worked on the eastern front killing bandits he was Baxilevsky's number two um but he was also famous in 1937 for chasing Jews across the border so he was actually entering into Holland chasing Jews and hunting them down and killing them in Holland so that's the German chief of police of Aachen running around in Holland Goodness. but you cannot find evidence of the general population doing this what you do find, um, and it doesn't make me entirely popular with a lot of people, is that I have discovered that a large number of the middle-class business owners and middle-class academics very quickly became Nazis, mm -hmm. almost like overnight. And um, the Aryanization of property, uh, especially businesses, was almost complete by the end of 1934. It's one of the fastest cities to Aryanize. But a lot of it, I think, is because the Jewish community had a special relationship with the Catholic Church. I'm not going to bore you too much, but during the Kultur Kampf in the 1860s, when Bismarck was doing his thing, and, and let, let me tell you, Bismarck is the most unpopular man in Germany, <laughs> in Aachen, sorry. Um, when he was doing his thing against the Catholic Church, in the 1860s and 70s, the Jews were the people who were collecting the Jews on, um, you know, the uh, loans on houses and rents and taking that and giving it to the um, Catholic um, clergy who had fled to neighbouring Files, which is in Holland. And that became a very much a German community. The Jews collected all the ground rent and took it to their friends in the clergy. There was a very, very strange and very strong relationship between the Catholic Church and the Jewish community. When Bismarck did his thing and the Chamber of Commerce had to leave, the Jews in the Chamber of Commerce took over and ran the businesses on behalf of the businessmen. There were very strong ties. They were also very supportive of the university. And some of some of Arkan's uh, leading aeronautical scientists, uh, especially the guys under, not part of Hugo Junkers. Hugo Junkers set up the aeronautical engineering department in about 1912, but afterwards, the guys that came in, the mathematicians, the aerodynamics chaps, many of them were Jewish guys. And one of them actually um, received the Nobel Prize for mathematics. And there was this strong relationship between the Jewish community and the Arkan community and aviation, funny enough. So that's kind of like the story behind. Um, slowly being dragged, what I would say is Arkan is slowly being dragged into becoming a Nazi state um, or Nazi community, mostly by middle class opportunists, because the, the working class have got no chance. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. and, they're either in the army or they're out on the sea free line digging ditches. Um, it's mostly, as far as I can see, affected 
landowners who'd lost properties due to the plebiscites after 1919, or it's a large part of the middle class who'd suffered during the Great Crash and later, and trying to pick up benefit. Who support the Nazis? Large numbers of school teachers. It's it's interesting because I that process, for the the want of a better expression, it, it seems in a lot of popular minds there's this rush through it, and we why I think it's important to to chat about Aachen as a city before we get to thirteenth of July. 43 is to understand its journey as well before it itself comes under attack which is why I was interested that, that I found that all very fascinating that there's this you know as when you were showing us around the town having that conversation about how it was by its very roots a very independently minded German city yeah I think so uh, I mean part of it um, you know I we could go another dynamic, which is if you look at the primary industries back then, one of the most prominent, <laughs> and I know this bores, bores you and Woody equally and everybody else, but it's the railways. <laughs> oh, and if anyone is drinking, waiting for Phil to mention the railways, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> one of the founder industrialists of Arkham is a man called Hansemann. And Hansman's big in the 1848 revolution, and but he's also the industrialist brings the Arken and Münchner Insurance Company to Arken. Uh, he b- brings textile factories, but at the same time, you've got an Englishman who's come in with Napoleon. I'm going my way back now. So one of Napoleon's famous English industrialists, a guy called Cockrell. I'm sure you've heard the name Cockrell in Belgium. He brings steam engines into the community, not railway steam engines, but steam engines for the textile industry. On the back of that industry, Hanselman comes in and starts expanding the textile industry. He starts pushing the Chamber of Commerce towards an industrial route away from the rural thing. And so what you see is a massive expansion of the needle industry, the textile industry, light engineering, the university expands from a polytechnic um, but the, the the main part of, of what Hansemann and a, a guy called Kamphausen do Leopold Kamphausen is they link up with the Belgian bank and bring in the German army engineers and they build the railway line from Cologne to Brussels and that changes Arken and what you see is this golden age, which suddenly kicks off around about the 1860s, and it continues till 1900 when <clears throat> the Kaiser comes to town and declares Gem- uh, Aachen as a big city, a Großstadt. And so you've had this, this sudden shift. It's gone from a kind of a Catholic backwater uh, remnants of Charlemagne and the end of the Holy Roman Empire that Napoleon had smashed in 1806 and it was now this really flowing dynamic city and of course it's bringing in Belgium it's bringing in Holland and so you've got a very uh, I don't know if you remember when you walk the streets but it's a very diverse architecture some of it's local Arken some of it's Belgium some of it's Dutch some of it's in between um, and, it, and it makes for a very unusual mix really yes very the other thing is and and it's completely forgotten um while during the 19th century hamburg is having many many bouts of cholera which richard evans then wrote a book called death in hamburg um arkham's last cholera outbreak is 1832 and the reason why is they dis in the 1840s they dismantle the fortifications because arkham was one of those traditional medieval round cities they dismantled all of those fortifications and they used the stone to make the canals for the river form which meant it was a very clean city very early on so you've got the public side of um, public health which is very much the prussian thing i suppose Mm -hmm. unlike the hanseatic you know 
as the Prussians will tell you, the dirty Hanseatics in Hamburg. <laughs> all, of, you know, all these different <laughs> states having a go at each other. Um, but basically, you've got a very clean, orderly city, which is ramping up to go towards modernism. So all of this idea that somehow Germany is this Teutonic state and it's a fell, fell feudalism and blah, blah, blah. Really? Well, not the case of Aachen. And I think the problem that happens for Aachen is it gets dragged into all of this crap politics. Um, I think it has two chances. In 1806, it has the chance of being French. And maybe things would have been different if it had gone that way and if Napoleon hadn't been so greedy for constant war. Um it could have continued down that radical road because the revolutionary forces that were pushing things like the Chamber of Commerce and education, they were really benefiting Arkham's growth. So, you know, you see a lot of education taking place and a lot of activity, movement, social change up until about 1815. Then the Prussians come in and they start crushing everything, um, especially Carnival. Arkham has Carnival in February. Mm-hmm. And the Prussians, for like a hundred years, hated it. Um, the Nazis tolerated it, but thought it was a protest. You know, thought it was a protest movement. Um, and Carnival still goes on. It's mad. It's crazy, but it's incredibly political at times, <laughs> <laughs> which, of course, also helps. Um, but we're a very. You have to understand, it's a very conservative part of the world which has radicalism, which a lot of people, you know, you can't get your head around it. You know, what is it with these people? They're conservative, they're deeply conservative, but they have radical ideas. Um, and that's the Archon that's about to go into a war, which generally, have, from what I can see, and I've read as many newspapers that have survived because an awful lot, sadly, an awful lot was destroyed in the war. Um, it was a reluctant going to war. I don't get the impression anybody wanted it. Um, it changes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what triggers the change? Um, I hate to say it, but it's bombing. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. We're, we're back to the aviation part of this podcast. <laughs> I, I, I guess you sussed that, um, that I was going to say that because it's kind of the theme that we're here for. Well, I, I think just to, to give a bit of context here, I wasn't aware, so we were, we were chatting about this um, last summer, how early Aachen was targeted. And that makes sense considering it's the closest, realistically, the closest German city to to bomb really in in that little triangle around Holland and Belgium. But I, I hadn't realized it was as early as that. So the effect of that, the early, not particularly devastating attacks, but that starts changing the mood of the people, does it? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm having to rustle papers here because I can't, I, I honestly, with all of the dates and everything going on, I just want to make sure that I'm not lying to people. Um, um, but we we were supposed <laughs> we were supposed to be starting with a different composite set of papers, but it doesn't matter. I will find them, and I will just kind of bullshit rhubarb rhubarb for a minute, just so I can get the dates, because I think you'll probably find it quite amazing. Um, and who was there to witness it is possibly also of interest to people. Um, when I dig out my piece of paper from all of this. Um, but the first raid as I'm, uh, that I can remember was on the 13th of May, 1940. And as far as I remember, the Air Force managed to kill a British lady as she was crossing the road. Um, in the first year, they killed three people and seriously wounded 19 but but they discarded bombs all over the city and um the one of the 
one of the major people in the city at the time to see all of this going on was a chap called um, William Shearer. Now, you might remember him as the guy who wrote the book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Yes. He was actually... <laughs> He was an American war correspondent, and he was actually in Arkan on the night of the 21st, 22nd of May, when somewhere between, and nobody really knows, somewhere between 20 and 40, or could be 60, Wellingtons, Hamdens, and Whitleys decided that they were going to bomb Arkan. Now, what I discovered in, in the stuff that I've been doing is that the bombing of Arkan isn't meant to be bombed. I'm I'm shocked that they hit somewhere they weren't supposed to be targeting. Um, what they're supposed to be bombing is a whole load of major military installations, right? And those military installations include, as we mentioned, the Deutsch, uh, the the Dortmund Ems Canal. Um, and also, um, they try to bomb. Um, here we go. Um, they try to bomb um, fuel. Can I, I just say fuel. it's it's nice to have you on the hop for a change because you usually do that to me. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. So on the thirteenth and fourteenth of May, they dropped ten bombs on Arkan, just across the city. Right? Mm -hmm. On the 15th of May, they drop 132 bombs on Arkham. Then you think, well, how are these Germans understanding this? Well, actually, they're going around counting them. Okay. Uh, on the 21st, 22nd of, of May, the evening, they drop 95 bombs on Arkham, and it's witnessed by William Sharia. And it's in his Berlin diary of 1942. And um, for him... It's quite interesting having somebody there to record it because an awful lot of what's been, what was recorded at the time has been lost mm -hmm. because Arkan archives were not only bombed, but then the American army decided to use the paper uh, to warm themselves because it was so cold in the city. So all the archives were used and trashed. Um, so according to Shearer, on the 22nd, 20, 21st, 22nd of May, and he's in the centre of town. Nineteen, We're, we're still 1940. This is 1940. Yep. Um, the air raid warning went off at 12 o'clock, and the bombing continued right the way through. The sirens stopped at 12.40, so they were running for 40 minutes. Um, but then the flat gun started, and then there was a constant stream of aircraft coming over. He could also, well, he says he heard the smaller aircraft of fighters. I think they were smaller bombers. Mm. Yeah. I think you've got the big Wellington, but I think there were smaller ones like Blenheims coming along that were less noisy. But anyway, this noise went on till two o'clock in the morning. And then he decided they're not going to hit me because they're not hitting anybody but hitting everywhere but the railway line and the railway station, which is what he thought they were trying to attack. Um, and he makes a comment that he's really surprised that the roar hasn't yet been destroyed and this war's been going on for a month. So the idea that the bomber's always going to get through, the bomber's going to destroy everything, no. No. So he, he's he's saying in, in those diary entries that he's surprised by that, and yet he's seeing a rather scattered result of a reasonably major bombing raid, and he's still connecting those two things together. Well, the, the he's working as a correspondent for the US newspaper agencies, mm -hmm. and so he's a neutral, but under German propaganda control but they keep taking him off to places so they go off to an M they go off to an hospital which has been bombed by the royal air force um they go and visit a hamden and a whitley that are crashed in fields 
and they have a you know have a look at the airplanes and talk to the people and have a chat about how good or bad the aircraft are um he does make a comment at one that the Luftwaffe were stealing bits off the remains of one of the aircraft um can't think why german aircraft were stuff were far better so um he does see he does see the war as it's developing not going the way he wants it to go he's very much i want this lot got rid of yeah mm -hmm. so he's not a pro he's not pro german just because he's with the germans the problem is it's not going the way he wants because the bombing is just all over the place chaotic and it's not, and they haven't seen any effective bombing. So he's he's impatient for it. Yeah. Now, twenty raids um, or thereabouts in nineteen forty is enough for the people of Arkham to say, "Oi, you Nazis, we want bankers." So the French prisoners of war who are brought gradually through um, are put to work on building bunkers. Now, I don't know if you saw any of them, but some of the big ones are huge, and I mean huge. They, they kind of... Well, they can take up to... Apparently, one can take up to 20,000 people. Goodness. We didn't. I think when we were there, we didn't get time to go over because we went to the cathedral and went for a beer. <laughs> but yes, twenty thousand people. So that's not in you know relative luxury. That's going to be crammed in. But that is a oh, huge, huge number of people in a massive concrete box. I, I do know the story. I mean, some of the stories are problematical i mean if to see that to see the, the the large bunker near the railway station where it supposedly could take the whole community of the franca fertile area um it's actually two bunkers that have been put together and i show it to people because you can actually see the two different doors it's actually the same bunker built to a certain model design prefabricated concrete but put side to side um it's about four people but if you go inside um one area they still had the floors so there's five floors Get this. that's how big they are now in the 30s they started to build an underground air raid shelter so already there was pre-planning and, and, you know, one German historian I, knew, I used to know, Bernd, Bernd Lemke, he, he wrote a book about civil defence in the 30s. And in Aachen, they were building certain, um, certain bunkers and certain uh, air raid protection services long before the war started. But that was like in going on in Embry City. But the German people now demanded... And there was a the Arkham has said enough. We want we want air raid protection. Now, a lot of the air raid protection was actually cellars. So you've got large tenement houses with four or five floors of families, where the people would run to cellars. Um, and at the end of my street, at one end there was a bunker and at the end of the other was a bunker and then there were we were because of the position where we are we were tied in with the Siegfried bunkers so you've got the Siegfried line bunkers and you've got the mm -hmm. civilian bunkers and believe it or not there's a huge difference the Siegfried line bunkers you can actually stand inside and shoot out you can't shoot out of these air raid bunkers so once you're inside you're solid now I've got a report of when one of the bunkers, one of the air raid bunkers, the people inside were shut in overnight um, because the air raid was intense. And there were 1,500 people in that bunker. It's regarded as one of the small corner ones. And it took a week 
for the Technische Nothilfe, which is the uh, technical emergency services, to clean the bunker out. Oof. So you've got to understand when, you know, I, one woman said to me that she was locked out and she hammered on the door um, to get in because of the intensity of one of the raids, um, I'm surprised she would be heard because if you stand at those iron doors and you bang them, I can't imagine anybody inside could hear a thing. And, of course, they're designed to cope with gas. So you, they're sealed, and then you've got filter systems up on the top. And the one that we had across the road here, uh, several bombs had bounced off it. It, it no longer exists. It was one of the first. It was built, it was completed in 1940-41. Um, and it was just like a house with a roof. Uh, I took pictures of it from the outside when they were demolishing it because these things take an awful long time to demolish. And they use a drill hammer. Um, it took seven months for them to drill it down to nothing. And there were like 40 trucks a day moving chunks of stuff because it, you know, it's really heavy and there's iron metal rods within them. And then you've got steel girders holding the floors. I mean, these things were not built. <laughs> they were they were built to take real punishment and, and they did. They survived it. Um, so they started to build them and there was about 25 constructed between... 1940 and 1944. Now, that in itself is explains why Arkan um, casualties from the bombing wasn't as high as anywhere else. With the number of bunkers they were created, was that because they were very loud and persuasive in getting them built, or was that similar across the rest of the country? Uh, I don't think it was similar because uh, Dresden never re never got to the same extent. Um, certainly didn't in Hamburg. Um, I think half of it is the influence of the Catholic Church, though they won't tell you. And if you go and ask them, they're not exactly wanting to tell you anything that they did positive under the Nazi regime. And I, okay, you know, I can understand that, um, but. Um, the construction, and here's the beauty of all of this. One of the first cities examined for a bombing survey was Arken because uh, Harris was so pushed to get evidence of proof that what he was doing was correct. Arken became the test bed not just for the bombing of the raids and well, it became, became the test bed of all the results. Mm. And there's a huge file on the air raid shelters on how they were constructed. Uh, and they interrogated the people at the time, uh, especially the police officers, to understand how these things were constructed and how the process of construction took place. And um, it's very interesting. The Arkham City citizens, the stat archie, have no idea of any of these things, of any of these reports. When I went to the city archivist and said, do you know about this? He said, no, they had no idea. So a lot of the Royal Air Force records have never really filtered into Arkans history. In fact, none of them. So I could go and look at the one across the road in the sand car and ask questions of it. Mm -hmm. And all the measurements were there, uh, how it functions, how it worked um, in a Royal Air Force, Royal Engineering Establishment uh, study. Um, and that's why I knew what certain ones did have proper canals for human waste and others didn't. So you've got a city that has a few disadvantages to it. It's... It's within easy range, I guess. 274 air, aeronautical miles. Yeah, so it's not far away. You can carry a heavy bomb load to it because of that. So if you're wanting to try out 
different things, it is a, a good city to, to try things on. So that continues. You said there was, what, 20 raids in 1940. And I guess that number just increases as we as we go. Yeah, forward. I mean, you're, you're looking at uh, about 130 raids by the Royal Air Force and upwards of 50 raids by the American Nova Tactical Air Force. And, and the last raid was in 19, October 1944 when the 9th dropped 168 tonnes of bombs on the city. So the, the, so the ninth go after it, do the, do the 8th, do the, the strategic guys? Two raids by the 8th Air Force. They, they conduct a HS2 oboe test, which I thought was odd, and they conducted a navigation test. What Arkham became for the United States Air Force, 8th Army Air Force, was a rally point. Imagine, how many air raid sirens did the go off here in Arkham? 1,079 air raid warnings in Arkham during and immediately after the war. Because with the Lancasters coming over to bomb Ulich, which is literally just down the road, um, people just sounded the air raid alarms out of, I suppose, practice. Because I guess you're not sure if they're going to, well, I guess if you've been bombed many, many times since the start of the war, you're going to play safe, aren't you? Yep. Because, you know, having <laughs> having the map up, it it's it's a fantastic IP for everything from Düsseldorf down, isn't it? You to turn and start heading back up that way, or head south down towards Mannheim and and, and places like that, and stuck up with the, the big engine factories. Yeah, and the and the German air raid system, they know they know the targets because the aircraft come the same route, usually through Holland. Mm-hmm. Well, not usually, always through Holland. Um, and then once they've hit certain points in Holland. And you only have to look at the, you know, the plotting diagrams in the RAF planning rate, raid planning books. It's always the same route. Um, they either go down to Arken or they go up towards the Ruhr, Dortmund, Dusseldorf, Hamburg. You know, but they always come through the same, pretty much the same area. So let's start focusing in on the raid. 80 years ago today when this goes out. There's a lot of things afoot within Bomber Command at the moment as part of what they called Operation Gamora. Is Arkin on the list again because A, they probably are used to finding it, B, it's the right sort of construction. So when they decide to to bomb it before in those sort of trial raids before Hamburg. Is it just because it's the place they they tend to go? I know that sounds simplistic, but it is Bomber Command we're talking about. If you were were to look at what actually happened in July, so let's Mm -hmm. just take July. You've got raids on Cologne on the 4th, Cologne on the 5th, on on the 8th, Gelsenkirchen on the 9th, Turin on the 12th. Arken on the 13th, Montbilliard on the 15th, Hamburg on the 24th. So between Arken and Hamburg, you've got 11 days. So you start asking yourself some questions. And and the first one to me was, why did they kind of have a long break between Arken and Hamburg? Because it seemed a bit odd. (laughs) <laughs> and it was dissecting Arkan that I thought maybe there's something a lot more going on here than meets the eye so um, I started with what's called the B forms do you know the B forms or do I have to explain them it's probably best if you do explain them just for the dear listener. Okay, B forms are these teleprinter orders that come spewing out on the morning, round about lunchtime on the 13th of, of, of July, and they detail the raids. Um, so you, the, the time on target is going to be 1.30 a.m. on the morning of 14th of July. So they depart 
I don't know, six, seven o'clock um, from UK. And then they do all their rallying things and then they coordinate and then they go through their waves and all the rest of it. So they're due to arrive at 1.30. Um, you do know that the all the German cities were <laughs> named after some form of fish. Really? I didn't know that. You're kidding me. No. Well, the dude Saunderby was a fisherman. <laughs> so what was Arkin? Elva. Hmm. You don't know what an Elva is? I don't. Do never heard of it, yeah. Is he, is, he na- is he naming them after German fishes, or is he just naming them after uh, general fishes? Neil. It's an eel that lives in blackish water. Okay. All right. So on the day, there's going to be two two raids. One's on Elva, and the other one's on white bait. But they change white bait to trout. <laughs> okay, so where, where's white bait and where's trout? Well, trout is Cologne. Right. So I kind of worked out that the bigger the city, the bigger the fish. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so the target is Elva. Now, if we were to go back for a moment with Len Dighton, there is actually a page in the book when he describes this and he says a senior officer of the Royal Air Force was a fisherman who declared all these passwords. So there is some truth in what Dayton has put there in that paragraph. That bit's never twigged in all the times I've read that. That is never – and in all the other stuff, I've never twigged that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm gen- genuinely sitting here a flummox. Anyway, sorry, continue. Right, so we're going fishing. All right. So the B form then goes on to describe it's going to be musical paramata. Do you know that? Again, no. Right. So (laughs) what it means is they're going to use oboe or G, which will coordinate, cross coordinate. Yep. So the navigational crews will fly in to a certain point. And Arkans on musical parameter. So if you look under uh, Wikipedia, it says, you know, it's all of these H2Os and all the rest of it. And and I, I, I make light of it, but I have actually got all the navigation files and all the records. And um, But, you know, for the sake of this discussion, let's just say it's basically a, a navigational device, electronic navigation device to coordinate the targeting. Okay, they've got five waves of aircraft. And the first wave, second wave, third wave are three group. Then the fourth wave is first group. And then the fifth wave is fourth group. And they're going to rendezvous just before Holland at six to 8,000 feet. And then they're going to hit the enemy coast at 15,000 feet or more, depending on which wave they are. Okay. All right? So the kind of detail that the B forms are giving them is huge. So they're also being told um, there's going to be training crews involved in this, especially the Mosquito trainers as Pathfinders. The Mosquito crews are going to hit Cologne and drop decoys. Uh, There's 76 mediums and 256 heavy aircraft. And the instructions start flowing in, not just from 1 o'clock, but they can keep going right the way through till 3 o'clock. What interested me on one of them was when they came to the bomb load and they're talking about HE and incendiary bombs. It said, quote, the arson load is to be carried as per 9th of July. It's written. So they're they're repeating what they've done so that they can correlate results. So the 9th of July is the raid on Gelsenkirchen. So they've done Gelsenkirchen under the instructions on the 9th of July. And then there's Turin, and then there's Arken. Now, Turin, I believe, there was only 274 aircraft, and they were doing a bombing raid, and they weren't fire raiding, as I understand it. Gelsenkirchen, I have evidence it was a fire raid, but not a big one. Lots of aircraft. There were more 
heavy explosives than there were incendiaries. Now, with the Arken raid... I, just so you know, um, I am cheating. I've got the translation of the German bomb damage report up here. <laughs> so if I start quoting things to you, that's because I, I have actually tried to prepare for this one. You have? Mm. Oh, cool. Yeah, so the, I've just... This is the um, uh, the Air Historical Branch's translation from fifty six um, of the Ocean Cushion one. So that's the the, Ger- the German report says five thousand, some five thousand incendiaries, five thousand phosphorus from Dulgadu. Do- uh, doesn't have an aircraft count, which is a bit strange. Yeah, that's so it's, a, it's that same load, only more aircraft. Right. Mm-hmm. So. There's different numbers being thrown around on the B forms that I've looked at, but generally speaking, the the official number, which the Germans actually love to quote in their main history, um, because it is quite a raid, they've got 200 more aircraft. They don't know how, how many, actually. 26 mines, 489 bombs, and 21,000 phosphorus bombs. Hmm. Okay. So back to musical parameter. Yes. Which I think is quite dudish. Preliminary target indicators will be yellow. Secondary target indicators will be red. Additional aiming point target indicators will be green. Main force will bomb on red. Now, what I don't understand, so please tell me, why you would go to such finite detail about the bombing raids and the only thing that you keep secret is the name of the cities? (laughs) Am I missing something here? It, 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 It sounds typically bureaucratic to me. Yeah. So the two decoys... And this is going to be interesting because it's raised an issue with me in thinking about it, is the two decoys are going to be green. So the additional aiming point green and then Cologne green. You've got to imagine Cologne's only like 50 miles away from here. Yeah, and if and if you're coming in over the Dutch coast, you would only have to be a few degrees to the left. And you could be in the wrong place. Right. So if we were to go back over some of the content of of all of these groups, so number one group is going to bring 36 Wellingtons, mostly Mark 10. Um, Number four group has got 146 Halifaxes, uh, another 21 Wellingtons. Um, Another group is 42 Halifaxes and 20 Wellingtons. And number eight group is actually flying mosquitoes. But then in all of this B-form craziness, they decide to take 18 Lancaster Mark IIs from Mildenhall. They then include 15 Sterlings from Mildenhall, another 10 Sterlings from Downham, um, another 16 sterlings from Stratis Hall, and another nine sterlings from Water Beach. So they're bulking this raid up with, it sounds like, what's available after a, a busy month. Or they're trying to husband the other heavies for something else that's coming. So the interesting thing about this raid then is you've got all of this junk flying over there doing this stuff. And... If you were to pick up an average study of the bombing of, you know, Bomber Command later into the war as we are now, nearly all of it's Halifax and Lancasters. And here we are with all of this other stuff. And these, not all of these are training crew. The training crew of the Mosquitoes, because the Pathfinder Force, number eight, has just been renamed in January 1943. And a lot of it's been skilled up. And, you know, these 38 mosquitoes in training, are they really going to be the worst pilots in the world with Pathfinder Force? No, I don't think so. I think their training is we're going to get used to how we're going to do stuff. Um, 
uh, and we're practicing those skills because they're already seasoned pilots. So the more I looked at the crews, the more I thought to myself, it, it, it appears like a training exercise, but I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I think this is actually quite serious stuff. So I then went to the operational research papers, which would not have been accessible for Dayton because they were not released till 1972. Uh, I had a look to see who would read this stuff. And obviously, Max Hastings didn't. Um, <laughs> Dear old Max. Yeah, I like the fact that he mentions all of these use of archives. And when I went through his notes, I couldn't find any archive and stuff. Um, but then that's naughty me. You know, interrogating the literature is second nature to us. But anyway, what the operational research guys were saying about this raid was quite interesting because in the first papers they've got well it was about 800 tons of bombs blah mm -hmm. when you come to read it later it's now a significant raid with 329 tons of high explosive and 538 tons of of incendiaries Now, Middlebrook, bless his cotton socks and his diaries, is is all into big tonnages and mentions of the aircraft. And, and, and all of that's very accurate. But to me, it's the mix in the load that makes the difference. All right? Now. Now, 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 now. The raid goes off. And... If you look at certain things like um, arrival, many of the uh, first target indicators being dropped as a, on that site that I was showing you was early. Mm -hmm. They were 10 minutes early, and that means a lot of the target indicators had already fallen out and disappeared. So um, the sky is a three-quarter moon, so there's a certain amount of daylight, and it's pretty much like, Today, you know, um, if, if you're walking down the streets of a dark area of Arkham at two o'clock in the morning in July, it's not that dark. Um, um, and this idea that somehow all the European cities are very dark places, uh, not really. And even the forest isn't very dark. So um, I think the aiming becomes um, quite a concentration point. They see what's gone before. That then concentrates and then concentrates and then concentrates. So the Royal Air Force has hit the medieval centre of Arkham, which in all their reports is still in existence. Uh, they claim there's 160,000 people living in that community. I doubt it. Maybe 90,000. Um, if they were still there in 1943, I don't think they were. Um I believe there were already 20,000 people had already left the city uh, and had been evacuated east. So um, there's a significant 65,000, 70,000 people in the city who possibly are working, uh, or that's what I used to assume until I went to look at the dead. Um, when you see the dead, you see women, very young children, and very old. So you know uh, the soldiers have obviously gone. The young men have gone to the soldiers. Um, a lot of, because the factories are not being hit in this raid, um, their air raid shelters are fine. So it's really the concentration on the centre on the medieval area has wiped out about 800 people in the space of about an hour and 20 minutes. Now, the flames are witnessed by a propaganda unit that happens to be in the city at the time, and they notice this strange uh, firestorm effect, um, this whirling fires. Uh, 
the fire brigade systems start to break down very rapidly. Now, we're, we're <laughs> it's quite an interesting period because in February 1943, the young men and women of the city are recruited to the flak units. And the flak gunners, who'd been there, you know, proper Luftwaffe soldiers, they'd been sent off to the east, as I don't know if you remember, I told you that uh, a lot of that regiment, uh, that battalion that was operating in the east in Birds of Prey, when we had a long mm -hmm. chat that time on that book, um, many of the many of the new squaddies that were coming through were flat gunners who were actually serving the guns here in Arkham. All right. Just for for the listener, the links to that very long discussion of Phil's book, Bird of Prey, will be in the description because that is very enlightening as to what these people got up to while they were being trained in the forest in the east. Sorry, continue. Right. So the city is actually being defended by children, which is it suddenly changes the, the whole complex of your thinking, you know. Um, the idea that you've somehow got a defence based on people not much older than 15 and 16. They're the, they're the only defenders of the of the batteries and they're at Beaveru, which is not far away from where we live and a little bit nearer the, the, the football club here. And there was also a railway line <laughs> with flat guns on, which would come from Cologne. And that flat train would provide flat cover um, Interestingly, the guns in Arkham were electronically controlled, radar guided, um, which is probably why they managed to take out three aircraft over target. Um, and there are stories of a Lancaster, in particular one case, blowing up, just literally mid-air explosion, completely blowing up. And the other crews could see it happen. Um, nobody, nobody survived it. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we're at the Pima Air and Space Museum uh, in our Hangar 5 uh, which, with more World War II aircraft. The aircraft behind us is a consolidated PB4Y2 privateer, which was a Navy patrol bomber derived from the consolidated B-24 Liberator. Um, as you notice, there's massive differences between this and the Liberator. The piece launch looks kind of the same, but it's actually an extended fuselage because there's more crew um, we need for like radar operators and um, and other additional crew members that were on the Navy patrol aircraft. Uh, it also did not have superchargers on the engines because they didn't fly at higher altitudes like the B-24 did, which also allowed them to rotate the engines 90 degrees. You also notice it has a single tail um, versus the twin tail on the B-24. Uh, the other thing that's interesting with this aircraft too is just its armament loadout is a little bit more. It has two top turrets, it has a uh, nose turret, tail turret, and two actual powered side turrets. Um, they were essentially used for patrol bombing, which would be, you know, searching for and attacking Japanese shipping and Japanese submarines, um, as well as bombing Japanese held islands. This aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew out of the Aleutian Islands for the last few months of the war, um, doing patrol missions uh, over northern Japan and bombing the Kuril Islands north of Japan that have, are a series of islands that have always kind of been contested between Russia and the Japanese. Uh, a bunch of privateers were modified after the war as fire bombers. They were given different engines and usually had their guns all taken off and were heavily modified to fight fires. Um, they were using them up until I think about the early 2000s when they started retiring them because of like um, metal fatigue and issues that they're having with the aircraft, uh, you know, that had been flying for 50 years plus in also very bad environments. But I've always thought this is a pretty unique aircraft. It's one of the only, this is the only privateer currently on display that has been modified back into its patrol bomber variant with the proper engines and all the turrets and all the radar and antennas on it. Um, so externally, this looks like it did in 1945 when it was uh, fine combat. 
To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. How prevalent at this time were those radar control guns by 43? Were they, I guess there wasn't that many of them across the, no. the breadth of the country. So to, Arkin, to no. have a, a battery of them was quite something. It was, but <laughs> the, the problem with them was it required a large amount of electricity. Mm. And what the Royal Air Force does for the next big raids um, especially the year later in April, um, they actually bomb on top of the guns with a view to breaking the electric cables, which of course then breaks the electric system for the city and all the rest of it. Yeah. I'm not going to go too far down that raid, but that raid was even more complicated than this raid. But anyway, um, so the fires kick off because it's in the old quarter of the city. And it gets worse and worse. Now, what people don't realise about the Royal Air Force when they're dropping their bombs, they don't just explode. Some will just lie around with delayed action fuses. So one bomb had landed by the theatre and there's an air raid shelter there. And they assumed it was a dud. And as the people came out in the morning... The bomb went off and it uh, and it killed about thirty people and wounded another score. Um, by this stage, the city was actually just a sea of flames and smoke. So, round about two o'clock, uh, an aircraft from Bomber Command—I don't know who. Uh, flew over and all the the only photographs they could get of the city was smoke. So they abandoned that run and they went the next day. And on the 15th, we know that the Germans had managed to put the flames out because there was no smoke over. And on the 15th, the pilots of the photo reconnaissance were able to take immaculate pictures. But what they do show, and obviously I can't show you in the pictures, but if you were to see... A target map, you would basically see that if Arkan is an orange, you go straight from the centre pip right the way round to, say, 10% from the edge. It's just red. Wow. And that then becomes the statement of the reports, which is Arkan has been burnt to destruction. Okay. And in the operational research final report, which is produced in September on the results, they state that Arkan is a dead city. So the there's a lot of questions with that. But at this stage, just for the story of the raid, the final point when the Royal Air Force ends the story of that raid is technically it's a dead city declared on round about the 27th of September 1943. And then every report afterwards becomes Arkan is a dead city. But they keep going back. <laughs> I, I know that sounds like a, a particular statement, but sure, surely if you've deadified a city, you don't need to expend blood and treasure going back yeah well now we're getting into seriously heavy shit aren't we because mm. and, and and to be quite frank the language that you're reading is becoming increasingly uncomfortable and that's the language of bomber command bomber command right okay so because i was trying to keep this in in line with um with the situation vis-a-vis -vis, um, Dayton, mm -hmm. I thought I would first of all give you a rundown of the losses of the raid, 
and give you an idea of what was happening and then just do the story of what it's like to follow the story of the of the dead afterwards as a as an examination of the notion of remembrance and why actually we don't remember yeah who these people are and they've become incredibly forgotten uh, i know this because you know, we'll talk about it later but i've actually been to the graves where these guys are buried now buried and no one's visited them for decades so what once the the ladies that you saw in the early 80s passed on people stopped going well, I'm not talking about the people in Britain, uh, in Germany. I'm talking about the people, the, the Royal Air Force crews. The crews. Oh, right. Sorry. Yes, of course. Yeah. People stopped visiting them decades ago, and the whole the whole area. It. Oh, let me tell tell you the losses, and then I'll say we, we'll we'll talk about what happened. Okay. So, um, there were, and I've got them all here, so you can see them. Uh, Eleven Halifaxes of. Uh, version 2 were destroyed, five Halifaxes version 5 two Stirlings, two Lancasters and two Wellingtons nine were accounted for by night fighters and technically three by Flak over city which means the shortfall is Flak or fighters or don't know um, if you look at the story of the crews, um, there's one or two with uh, POWs. Um, occasionally, you get seven injured, one dead. Um, two of the aircraft managed to get back home and then literally fell apart when they landed on the runway. Um, uh, crews that were destroyed in Holland several of them, the bodies just disappeared and have never been buried. There's no mm -hmm. marker for them or anything. Um, now, what interested me about one of the aircraft was <coughs> Halifax uh, Mark II, JD-175. It was shot down from... It was uh, serving with 78 Squadron and it crashed near Cologne. And I thought, that's odd. Now, do you remember the cell alternative target markers where the mosquitoes were dropped in green? Yeah, both, both were green, yeah. I wonder if he was confused. Because he shouldn't be near Cologne. That's a hell of a way to be out. Even if he's, even if he's damaged and he's falling, he's not going to go that way, that far. No, not even at so, 15,000 feet. I guess that comes back to, again, where that initial point was for the, the run south. He only needed to yep. be a few degrees off or being blown by wind and he's over Cologne. So when you look at the crews, very few survive. Um, very rarely does a whole crew get away. I've, none of the ones are the ones I've just described to you. Um, the night fighters, we, we, we don't really know Okay, there's a couple where we we've got some detail of what the fight night fighter pilot has said, but a lot of the stories, a lot of the flak, a lot of the circumstances of the aircraft being destroyed are not investigated. So, once an aircraft has gone, it literally just disappears off the manifest. Both the crew have gone, and uh, the aircraft. Now, okay, um, the way the numbers are split. You're losing seven pilots from, say, 35 Squadron, seven from, or eight from, 75 Squadron. They are not really having a large effect, but but you get to 102 Squadron and it's lost 24 pi um, airmen. That's, that's got to have a mark somewhere, hasn't it? It's a lot of empty beds. Yeah, and that's three tables at dinner, yeah. you know, so, or breakfast. And so, you know, you're looking at losses and, yeah, they're trying to filter out the numbers so it's not concentrated in any one particular squadron. And I found it very interesting when I was looking at the pilot averages. They're not the large numbers that you would 
think that they were flying. You know, some of them are only flying like four times in a month. Mm. Um, uh, that surprised me. What I did, what did surprise me, was those who were doing the most flying were the ones who were highly decorated or higher command or, and and so you know when you're going down some of these, a couple of the a couple of the pilots and a couple of the airmen are serious squadron leader, uh, squadron navigator or squadron gunner, and you're thinking <laughs> you're losing really an important player, chap there, and he's just wiped out. He's just forgotten. It's an awful lot of skill that suddenly disappears with the loss of one crew. Yes. So, for you, I decided to have a look at what happened um, before the war became really intense. So, 4th of June, 1940, a Hamden crashes on a Whitley crash. Um, I've not got much evidence of the Whitley, but the Handley Page Hamden um, has attacked communications in the area of Arkham. Now, Middlebrook has got no evidence of where the aircraft was attacking. He just said somewhere in Germany. Well, it's fair enough. So this crew is buried in Germany. They're buried in Arkham in the military cemetery, and they're given a full military funeral. But what the Germans do that you, you don't really think they're going to do is they do a full post-mortem. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so we know who the crew are. So uh, the captain is flying officer Hayden. Um, his number two is pilot officer Greenwell, who came from Rhodesia. Hayden, I think, comes from uh, Hertfordshire. Uh, Sergeant Perry came from Bristol, and Sergeant Thomas came from Manchester. So we've got uh, two officers and two sergeants. Um, they, uh, uh, the families are not told immediately. So uh, on, in sometime in June 1940, the father of Greenwell receives a letter stating... I am to explain that missing does not necessarily mean that he is killed or wounded and that if he is a POW, he will communicate with you in due course. <laughs> That's a really jolly... <laughs> That's really jolly if he's not dead, he'll be in touch with you. Cut it to the quick. Why bother to go down that other room? Anyway, they send... The families get sent handwritten telegrams. We've now had confirmation that your son is dead. 10th of July, they get a letter, state, the families get a letter stating your loved one was buried on the 7th of June 1940 with full military honours in Arkham Military Cemetery in plot 6, um, 16 to 20. And I, I, I can walk to that plot next week and take a view so you'd think now that's the end of the story well you know we could go through all of it line by line and i've got all of it here but it, the correspondence now goes on till 1951 goodness and what it shows you is a whole load of things that you don't hear from the history. So the process of communicating to loved ones, you know, you think they're getting a telegram and it's that message and, you know, but there's actually several letters, several processes getting in touch. And so, for example, on the 9th of January 1942, Mrs. Thomas has obviously asked what her son, how quickly her son had died. Uh, and Mrs. Thomas was informed that her son was killed instantaneous with being shot down. Okay. So we look at the post-mortem, which falls into the hands of the British in 1945 after the war, and Thomas' body was shattered in a destroyed aircraft 
and badly burned. Seriously badly burned. And he was burned while he was alive. Um, Perry, his head was crushed, his bones, all of his bones were shattered, and he was badly burned as well. So what you've actually got is quite a horrendous scene, really. You've got an aircraft that nobody knows where the hell it is. It's shot down and nobody knows how it's been shot down. And when it has come down, the men in it um, have died of atrocious injuries. Um, Hayden's body shattered, head crushed uh, and burned. Greenwell um, shattered body, but no burns. So on the 31st of December, 1945, so you can, you can see, it doesn't just stop. Greenwell's mother requests a photograph of the grave where her son's buried. And then they all get the standard letter, which is um, they will be informed in due course with photographs sent once the finalisation of the bodies and the positions and all the rest of it. Now, they then get, the Royal Air Force then gets the post-mortems from Dr. Kurov, who gave the post-mortems on the 5th of June at two o'clock in the afternoon for all four pilots. And he did that in the military military hospital in Arkham. The men were then taken from the military hospital on the 12th of June, and then they were buried. And they put the uniforms back. So they were buried with their uniforms? Full military honours with all their gear. And everything. Nobody stealing anything. No bodies plundered. Um, they were put in the graves and they were buried properly. On the 18th of June 1940, the Wehrmacht Bureau for Enemy Casualties was informed. On the 7th of June 1940, the Catholic Church in Arkham recorded the bodies in their cemetery and said that they would tender them as enemy dead. They were given crosses with English uh, Flieger, you know, mm -hmm. English pilot, blah, blah, blah. So, 27th of June, 1947, the Royal Air Force comes along and says, we've checked the bodies are in the graves and we know where all the next of kin are and now we're going to exhume the bodies and bury them somewhere else. And yes, they do a post-mortem. And that's why I know that when they buried them, um, for example, uh, one of them, Thomas, I think it was, had a Jersey penny coin in his pocket, had two royal sovereign pencils and his burn message pad. So even, yeah. even burying him with his pad shows that really everything was gathered together and, and put in. Into as the much area. as they could. Uh, he had his Air Force tunic, um, his trousers, his shirt with detachable collar. Um, the identity of this had been burnt. Uh, they knew that his hair was brown. He was wearing blue socks, aviations, uh, aviation socks, and white aviation stockings. And he had a cotton singlet, khaki scarf, and a flying shirt suit. And they're all the same, apart from Hayden, whose head was missing, um, but who was buried with his May West and his parachute harness. And he had Royal Air Force colours. You know the band mm -hmm. that goes round? The... He was wearing his colours, apparently, when he was flying. That's been good luck. Um, good luck, John. Uh, Perry, half of him had completely decomposed. So they then take the bodies to a place called Rheingarten, uh, Rheinberg, mm -hmm. sorry, um, which is about 11 kilometres away, um, miles away from, I think, Dortmund, uh, right on the Dutch border. And they say it's a very pleasant and selected for natural beauty. Well, I can tell you it's a godforsaken place in the middle of nowhere um, with poor public transport, not particularly beautiful, 
and not particularly restful because the local Germans take their dogs for walks around it. Mm. And I know because I've been there and I've seen them do it. Probably the last time anybody visited that cemetery was 2005 because that was on the reef on one of the graves. But nearly all the graves are barren. They're tended to by um, a crew from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission uh, who are Germans, young German lads. And they were quite happy to come and tell us how it was and they were doing their cleaning. And, and it's immaculate, don't get me wrong, but it's a very, very, very sad place. And anybody who tells me that, you know, there's all this remembrance going on, well, there's not for these guys. And And the men who've been buried there go from May 1940 right the way up to the Arnhem and the and, and the Reichswald battles in 1944-45. Um, what struck me most about all of this was it didn't matter how many times the Royal Air Force was told that Mrs Thomas was dead. They carried on writing to her. She died... She received the letter in January 1942. She died on the 19th of September 1942. And they continued to keep in touch with her. Eventually, they managed to get hold of an aunt so that they could contact her. Hayden's story is quite interesting because clearly within a year of him being killed, his wife married another flying officer and she abandoned any interest in a former husband. So in 1943, uh, Hayden's father wrote to the Royal Air Force saying, I'm now next of kin. Please ensure that I get all my gear. The Royal Air Force wrote a nice letter saying, as soon as we get all of their gear back, we will send it to you and dispose of it as necessary. There's no evidence that anything that was in those graves went to those members of the family. Um... When you look at what actually happened to the graves, of course, when they when they um, decide that they're going to shift the bodies in 1947 to Rheinberg, they start putting uh, asking members of family to make, you know, epigrams and whatever. Um, so Greenwell's family said, um, "There's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England." Um, Perry's family wrote uh, this corner of a foreign field that is forever England mum and dad uh, Thomas and Hayden got nothing and still have nothing um, I discovered later that Perry was 20 years of age but we don't know how old Hayden was I'm assuming that Thomas is about 20 and we don't know how old Greenwell was which is fascinating, really, when you think about it, because the Royal Air Force has got all these personnel records and has no idea how old these guys are. I find it quite fascinating that when they came to the conclusion that they were going to take photographs of the graves, the process they went to to send photographs carefully made of each grave to each family and then not know which address they were sending to was just a stunning. <laughs> just my god when does bureaucracy ever work unless you're living in germany so there you are it's a little story um the last communication on the family files was in 1951 as i say when they decided to try and get in touch with everybody uh, with photographs of the newly minted crosses they were then going to do the stones the commonwealth war grave stones but that hadn't happened at that stage and then at the very end the air ministry decided um, because they wanted to have a final record of the casualties they went around asking all the various departments so internal memos asking what trades the airmen were which again i it it baffles me that you can have a that would be on their that would be on their intake form, surely. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, 
when I looked at a similar situation with the flyers from the other raids, um, there were worse stories. But, I, you know, the, there's only so much of this stuff um, listeners can take, really. So <laughs> I think I think that that one case is is telling. Having climbed around that uh, Hamden at uh, up at um, Cosford that's being restored, you wouldn't want to be caught in that if it was on fire. You wouldn't have been caught in Lancaster if it was on fire, but the Hamden's only 36 inches wide. Um, so there's next to no chance you're getting out of that. And if you're getting thrown around inside of it, yeah, then that would explain what those poor, the injuries those poor lads had. Yeah, and, and it just struck me as very odd that you, you're losing all of these crew and all of these highly capable technical people and not really wanting to know. Or is it accepting that given the time that aircraft was lost, they they knew they had no clue where they were going? Ask yourself the question, why did the Royal Air Force start to exhume the bodies in 1947 and put them in graves like that? And, you know, it speaks to certain things. One is, by the end of the war, I think the animosity between the Royal Air Force and the German people, the Royal Air Force said, we don't want these, we don't want our lads buried in places where they might be vandalised or vilified. We want to put them in protected places out of the way. I think it speaks to the fact that a lot of flyers have been killed in their local communities. I mean, I could tell you the story about the two American airmen who were badly beaten in the streets of Arkham and, and what happened to them. And and there was a trial afterwards. But if you look at if you look at what happens after the July nineteen forty three raid, all of the crews who are killed in the Arkham area are buried in Munch and Gladbach. That far away. Mm-hmm. It's only on the train. It's only like forty-five minutes, an hour away. But the the, the point is, I, I don't think you could bury them in the in the. You couldn't be burying Royal Air Force aircrew in a cemetery where you're burying eight hundred Germans. Mm. Yeah, and already now you're you're seeing a break. The, the 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 actual break between the two societies, you're actually now, and that that this is the point that I wanted to make. Now we're seeing genocidal warfare. Okay, so let's define what you mean by that, because <laughs> the 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 G word immediately takes people in one direction. But when we're discussing genocidal warfare, something that you've been um, looking at quite a bit over the last year with the the new book about Ukraine and Putin. When you say genocidal warfare in this context, what do you mean, sir? Well, there's five rules um, for levelling genocide in war and crimes. Um, one of them is killing the civilians, another is destroying culture and civilization, and the other is preventing them from having you know, um, multiplying, what do you call it? Um, preventing childbirths, mm-hmm. like happening in Russia at the minute, and stealing the children and all of that stuff. A mass killing of civilians and defenseless people and so and such and so forth. None of that existed when this happened. The word genocide, as far as I'm aware, didn't exist in 1940. So why would I go the way I'm going? Well, I think if you'd have said before before the year 2000, if somebody had gone up to you and said the bombing was genocide, most Holocaust students and academics would have probably said in response, the bombing isn't like Auschwitz. Because Auschwitz was this, this horror, so horrible in civilization that they can't imagine anything worse. Now, subsequently, we've learned that Holocaust by bullets, the destruction of over a million and a half to two million Jews through rifles and bullets and the trigger pullers in the in the Wehrmacht and the SS, 
It's changed the attitude of how the Holocaust, A, functioned, but also it tells you something about how genocide is practiced by troops. And it takes a, you know, it doesn't take a lot to work out that if you train a whole load of soldiers to kill, it's not difficult to kill civilians, mm -hmm. right, with rifles. Well, here we've got bomb droppers and bomb releases. And the question you have to ask is, at which point did the bombing become genocidal? Didn't kick off genocidal, did it? Or did it? Now, the usual rule is, in the general thinking of things, is that the violence of the bombing is limited by the te technology of the aircraft involved. And therefore... Because they weren't capable of smashing cities like Dresden in 1940, it wasn't in their mindset. And any case, the Germans uh, come along in June, what is it, September 7th and 8th of uh, 1940, September 1940, and they do their Blitz of London, and, and that's the beginning of extreme warfare which the Royal Air Force has to respond to which is an interesting argument. But what happens if the language already existed before that time? What happens if you start having to ask questions about what the Royal Air Force is, is creating instructions about? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, on the 30th of June, 1940, Bomber Command produced or drafted instruction number 37. And you might find this interesting because what it's about is the Royal Air Force destroying German forests. And it's what they write. So forget about the aircraft and what the capabilities and all the rest of it. What they write is, and it's Air Vice Marshal Bottomley, great moral and material damage may be inflicted on the enemy by burning his forests. Forest fires by, are feared by mankind throughout the world and cause considerable psychological effect on the inhabitants in their vicinity due to fear. To prevent localization, there should be widespread fires near large centers of population. Panic is more likely in the thickly populated areas. That's not military targets, is it? You're creating a psychological weapon to use against a population centre. Good couple of mums before the big one. Now, the question is, what kind of weapons were they producing to do that? Well, they were producing weapons called incendiary bombs, purely for this purpose. And the Special Psychological Warfare Directive, uh, directive which existed in 1940, was actually planning to create bombs full of petroleum which would explode in the forest and burn the forest down. Now, from the German perspective, when the Royal Air Force started to bomb the forest, the Germans thought, <laughs> they thought these people are either lost <laughs> or pretty stupid because the nature of German coniferous forests that they're not easily combusted but that's not the issue the issue is what's the language mm -hmm. if your language exists to create certain conditions when it's capable when you have the capability to fulfill those conditions then there's a synchronicity between the language and and, and the weapon here I would put to you, by reading this instruction, which is purely about terrorising the people, the Royal Air Force has taken the lead. And if you go back to the first raids from the 13th of May, which is well before Rotterdam has been put to the fire, which, by the way, is very interesting because in the official history of the Luftwaffe, the Royal Air Force does not attribute the burning of Rotterdam as a deliberate act, 1947 book, Green Book. So that they're, they're saying that 
the burning of Rotterdam was burnt on accident as opposed to by design. Pretty much. Yeah. And, and, and it's always differed between what was the reason. Now, Richard Overy makes the point that Churchill never bombed German, um, German cities because of Rotterdam. And I, I entirely agree with him. Because the, the Brits are already bombing German cities beforehand. Now, I, I've heard all these stories that they were totally lost and they didn't know what they were bombing, which you can see from the evidence, but I also think they knew what they were bombing because if you look at the reports on the bombing of Arkham before the 21st of May that William Shearer saw, they kept saying the lights are on in the marshalling yards in Arkham. It's a city that can be bombed. Hmm. Well, all of this flying out towards the coastway to make sure the bombs only land on the docks might have been a thing then, but it certainly wasn't a thing in May 1940. So the shift happens quite quickly towards yeah. what would what would become sort of mass a year later. Yeah. So you've had 20 raids on Arkham before the raid the Blitz of London. Now, I'm not saying that that makes, you know, that, that puts Hitler off the leash because that's not the argument here. The argument is, what are the technocrats of the Royal Air Force thinking about the way they're going to conduct war? And if they're going to conduct war the most aggressive way possible, it's going to be to burn people. Well, first of all, you burn the forests to conflate a forest fire, which will spread into the cities and burn the people out. Well, that's 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 fairly naughty. Mm. By the time you get to 1943, they're using the arson word. Now, let's dial it back. So, half the story with the with the bomber command scenario is well, we had to bomb because. Hitler was doing evil things across occupied Europe and this, that, and the other. And there is some truth to that. Okay. So if you actually look through the black books and the and the various documents that existed in, in Royal Air Force files, this is Royal Air Force content, it is full of evidence of massacres and atrocities that the Nazis have committed in Poland, in Holland, in Russia, in Greece, in, in in France, all across occupied Europe. The Royal Air Force is dropping leaflets on France to show the war crimes in other parts of Europe. So everybody knows. Question then is, why doesn't that come up in in as targeting because if you're if you're if you're really there to stop the crimes then technically i suppose you should destroy the camps you should destroy the railway lines you should do you know workplaces why would you carry on bombing civilians and by the way when you kill these civilians how is their morale going to affect the nazis who don't give a shit because they've said that in the reports. It, the, the Nazis don't care about anybody. So why should they? Why should the Nazis care about the morale of their own people? So by bombing the German civilians, what are you achieving? Now, okay, it's all about morale, but whose morale? So then, go a few years later, and you ask yourself, well... What does the Psychological Warfare Division of Schaaf say? Well, it says, the Hamburg experience demonstrated that bombing alone, even if of unexpected intensity, has only a temporary adverse effect on German civilian morale. They said that on the 25th of August, 1944. 25th of August, 1944. So that's that's just before they shift. That's what three months before they shift the strategic bombing back to, to Germany, before Bomber Command get really stuck into Berlin in, yeah. over the winter of 45. 
and and psychological warfare recommend advance warnings that a raid is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. So you've got a psychological warfare saying Hamburg hasn't worked. How do you get to that? I'll tell you how. Various organisations in British society have been tracking a mass opinion in Germany as they have been in Britain. And nobody knows because you haven't bothered to look. <laughs> what were the organisations? Everything. Foreign Office, Ministry of Information. They all are. And they're collecting a wealth of information. Can you imagine how much information can be gleaned from an empire that spreads across the world that has to negotiate with Germans in other places? So they're getting all that feedback, which is all coming back to London and then being collated and crunched and being fed into the... Put before Winston Churchill. And so you've got this paper, which I've taken from the 25th of August, 1944, so, right, we're right in the end of the Normandy campaign. They're about to win the war, and the psychological warfare officer is saying, Hamburg didn't work, and we don't need any more. Because, you see, th this was this was going to be one of my questions, because the general perceived reaction of Hamburg is the famous Goebbels thing of the panic, the panic, the panic. But if they knew only, what is that, a, a year later, um, 14 months later, that it was a, or they would have known before because then the report was published late. They knew that that wasn't necessary or not having the effect that they want. So I suppose this is the, the sort of facetious question. Why switch back to that large scale area bombing when they knew it wasn't having the effect that it was supposed to be? Well, here's the interesting thing. Just a week before, the high command is saying, all our air effort should be directed at present to bringing about the defeat of the German armies in the field. That's not bombing the cities and morale. So the whole emphasis is this. So my question then becomes, you know, at which point is terror just another form of genocide? And so I went to look at the 13th and the 15th of February 1945 again, and what do you see? You see no warnings. And they're not just bombing Dresden that night. They're drumming Berlin, Nuremberg, and Magdeburg. Mm -hmm. That is mass terror. Now, let's blame Churchill for saying, yeah, we're going to bl blow up Dresden. Happy with that. But whoever put that plan together for that night was terrorizing Germany. There's no other words for it. So that's... What four four other major raids going on at the same time? Four other major raids going on, plus the window raids, plus the supporting raids elsewhere. Yeah, and then the next morning you get the Americans getting lost and bombing Prague. Yeah, yeah. and then it's Fordsheim, and then there's Wurzburg, and then Churchill writes his thing because he doesn't want to lose the election. Yeah. Um, so you, I, I I've got no time for Churchill, by the way. Just that that's that's come up in the past. <laughs> He's a shit. Always have. The whole family thought he was a shit too. Uh, you, you, you northerners. <laughs> My great grandfather voted for him when he was in Manchester because uh, he was a liberal then. And then, of course, when he wasn't. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's another podcast. I'm not going to get into that. So let's let let's contextualize this for the listeners. So Lemkin. Um, it's middle late forty four, isn't it, that he coins the term genocide that is then used later as the legal foundation for Nuremberg and things like that. So that there's a lot of people considering this this terminology based upon what was happening, and there's psychological reports being issued at Shafe, highest level of Allied command, saying this isn't working, and yet they. Still switch back to widespread area bombing months. I'm trying to think when it, when it was. Was it October that they released the, the heavies back to the, the strategic campaign? So it's yeah. it's October. yeah. So it's and you get the 1500 bomber raid uh, in November on Ulish, mm. which absolutely 
flattens you loop to one house. And that's specifically designed by Bomber Command to say, this is what we can do if you let us, which is a similar sort of thing as LeMay with his firebombing a year later in, um, yeah. in Japan. Yeah. That's what, goodness, five months later. So in the strictest understanding of the terms, it is. Yes. And um, what actually happens that I find fascinating, and I think it's one of the reasons why Bomber Command gets shafted. So here I'm in a funny position. The air crew have been set a task in which they have no choice. Mm -hmm. So would I blame the air crew? No. But who would I blame? Well, I blame the whole of the military in uh, civil military structure going from Churchill all the way down, and that's Churchill's cabinet, because they all knew all the way down. And the question is how much of it was a form of vindictiveness. I've heard it said that Britain wanted to wage such evil war on Germany that it never, ever did this again. Uh, and fine. But nobody writes that. What's happening here is we've come to the end of the war or we're coming to the end of the war and already everybody's rewriting the history. So, for example, who would have thought that somebody, if he was so despised, all his dispatches are being published by Her Majesty's Stationery Office so that all of the air forces, all of the squadrons around Britain can go to the library and read Bomber Harris's dispatches because they are regarded, quote, as really ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. All right, it's only a short publication, and it's before he produces his own book, Bomber Offensive, which I had somewhere. And it's still a story. Now, if you if you read what what Harris says, and he mentions Arkin twice in his main book, and he says on page 252, Arkin surrendered on the October the 21st and gave the Allied armies their first sight of a German town destroyed by firebombs. Okay, that can only mean 1943, because the raid before, in October 1942, when they used incendiaries, was a complete waste of time. And nothing happened, nothing came of it, and very few casualties. And then the last raids afterwards were all, all high explosive aimed at the railway system and shutting down the hub, because, because of the nature of where Arkin is, one line goes down to Normandy and another line goes down to Metz and another line is linked up to the north of Germany. So you can actually divert troops if another line is closed, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So it's a very important transport hub. So three raids, 11th of April 1944, it's nearly all high explosive, uh, except the Lancasters drop the bombs from the centre of town right the way through to the railway lines rather than hit the railway lines. The raids, mostly by Polish crews in the 1st, which is on the 24th of May, 24th, 25th of May, um, Lancasters, they wipe out one side of the railway line at Rota Erda, which is a little town just outside. And then the Mosquitoes come in for the 27th, 28th, and literally destroy the whole of the railway network. Yeah. And they do a raid in 20 minutes. And what the, the other 121 air raids had failed to do, this team of mosquito pilots who say, who everybody tells me, well, you know, accuracy is not really done. Well, they managed to get that accurate. So they destroyed the railway lines, the whole thing, and nothing's going to move for a week. There ain't many railway junctions destroyed so profoundly as that mosquito raid. Do, and then they don't come back. Do love a medium bomber. And then they don't come back. I don't get it. And, so, and then wait, you're reading... They, they, they don't come back at all through the Normandy... The, country. the United States Air Force comes back when it's about to... When the US Army is about to take Arkham. The, the, the ninth spend far, 
far too much energy on Arkin, don't they? From everything fighter bomber yeah. up, it's it's mad. Yeah, yeah, lightnings yeah. and all sorts of stuff. But the point is, the Royal Air Force stop on the twenty eighth of May, so they're still not within Normandy time. Mm-hmm. So the week later, Arkin is working again as a railway through line, because in August. The railway system is working so well that when the two American airmen are being beaten up in August of the uh, of um, 1944, uh, the Luftwaffe comes from the Luftwaffe representatives come on the train from Cologne, pick them up, and take them back. And the guys remember how how well the railway system's working, which means if the railway line isn't being attacked, that's the reason why the reserves are going down to Normandy. And I've said this many times. There's so many people who kind of get up, get lost after the Battle of Falaise. They just don't understand how the Germans are pulsing more and more reserves into the line and holding that attack. But, you know, there you go. So if you go to the official history, in 1945, according to the bomber survey, the purpose of the majority of the attacks on Arkham was to reduce the town's industrial potential by direct damage to plant, to housing and utilities and the destruction of the morale of the population, the workers. So you've got Harris Burnett and the official story we're doing destruction of plants and all the rest of it. What I still don't understand then, if that's the case, why did they miss the main factories? Now, when the engineers come in in 1945 and go around and look at all this stuff, they say, oh, that was definitely by the Royal Air Force. Well, how you can tell the difference between a Royal Air Force bomb and a 155 millimeter shell from the US Army or tactical bombs from 9th Air Force is quite beyond me. But these guys said they could do it. But that's not where the story ends, if we're going to talk about genocide. Because on the 2nd of March, 1945, Alan Brooke and Winston Churchill came to Arkham. And Churchill was so pleased that he had gone from seeing French houses destroyed to seeing the whole of Arkham laid waste. He was really pleased. In fact, he was so pleased that when he got to the Siegfried line at Ulick, Alan Brooke kind of implies he either did a piss or a shit on the Siegfried line. And that the damage had to continue. 20 days later, that dude writes a letter saying, I don't want any more bombing. So he's been there, he's seen it, and he's happy with it. And 20 days later, he's not. And yet the bombing of Dresden was the 13th, 14th of February. See what a lying piece of shit he is? I think the, I think that, the technical term there is politician, isn't it? And that's, that gets to the cut of what all of this is about. He's wanted that. And Harris has delivered, and that's the stain on the Royal Air Force that the Royal Air Force does not deserve under any circumstances. I'm at my usual point in, in our sort of discussions like this where, where my mind has got about 60 different questions two arguments and another part of it just going, huh? Um, (laughs) It's that switch is, is interesting because that, that mindset, we're going to call it a mindset change to be or vault face, whatever is such that Harris keeps delivering. Even after that, there's, there's massive, massive raids right up until, the end of yeah. April. So, e- yeah. so even when Churchill starts doing his post-Dresden hand-wringing of how terrible everything is, there's still no command order, and I guess this plays to command responsibility, to scale it back. It is in public very much, oh, this is a terrible thing. And then with his commander's hat on, well, keep going, Butch. Yeah, I mean... See, the funny thing is, come 1956, Churchill's in Arkham getting the Charlemagne Prize, and he's got no memory of what's happened. It, was he asked about it? No, 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 but he's standing in the ruins of the city where the ruins are all over, and there's no comment whatsoever. And, and you kind of think, where have I seen this kind of behaviour before? 
You know, a couple of his biographers behaved like this, didn't they? Behaved like? Churchill. Mm. You know, cause amounts of damage and then walk away saying it's nothing to do with me. And he, he, he's got a record of it. And his biographers have the same. And, and the idea of, you know, make-believe and rewriting the history book so it tells another story. Right. Um, it's like it's like when some Irish lad said to me, "Did you know that Churchill had planned to use gas on Dublin in the Irish uprising?" I kind of looked and I thought, "Hmm, really?" And they had documentary evidence, and I thought, you know, all these little threads, you know, the famine in Bangladesh, and then when I read Alan Brook, you know, I, I kind of read strange things and remember what's in them. And I wasn't reading Alan Brook for that. I was reading Alan Brook for something else because I was doing something on strategy. And I thought, why is he recording Churchill doing a dump on the Siegfried line and saying about Arkham? Well, of course. What I hadn't realised in the 50s when Alan Brook produces that book for the first time, Churchill's totally opposed to him, tries to have the book crushed. And then you find out Churchill has tried to put together a series of books that become the Second World War based on documents that nobody else has access to. And then at the same time, he's destroyed the Betchley records so that nobody has any idea that actually some people knew exactly what was going on. Because, of course, if you know exactly what's going on, you can't actually be gifted at understanding what the enemy's doing and using your nouns to... I don't know, corner him here and de defeat him here. And, you know, it, it changes the flavour of the man. And what Churchill, I, I've always thought this about Churchill. Go back to February 1945. Frederick Hayek, who is the guy who writes the book Rove to Serfdom, he's Churchill's speechwriter. He's the one that gives Churchill the idea of calling the, the, the Labour people, Gestapo. So already you've got this changing configuration of a politician who's working towards the July 1945 election, and he's throwing a huge dump on all of these men who've given their lives for him. I, I, I mean, I just it, it just appalls me. The sheer brave, I mean, I, you know, I could go into detail of some of the bravery of some of the pilots, and it's astonishing bravery. Yep. And the families who've had to put, be put through this rubbish, they've not only had to fly, watch their loved ones die in junk, but then it's been more and more and more. And, and the destruction across Europe, some of it's still, still not replaced. I mean, Dresden's church wasn't, you know, repaired until the 21st century. I mean, the, 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 you know, people in Arkan were still living in air raid shelters in 1955 when he came to this city. There was mountain, I mean, literally mountains of rubble. It took them 25 years to get rid of the last rubble, which happened in 1972. That's remarkable. Wolfgang Trees, when he was writing the books about Arkan and, you know, a guy called Charles Whiting, who was quite famous for writing weirdo books about the Germans and the Second World War and what have you. I mean, th they were recording stuff which is just beyond belief what went on. And, okay, um, you know, many of the young families, many of the young kids got hit with the bombs. And, and you know, the kids were asked in 1974, who they're now in their 40s, 50s, were asked what did they think about what happened, and the, all of them remember the parents of their friends sobbing and hysterical to discover that their their comrades had been caught in a raid, and all of that misery. And 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 you think, okay, the Germans are, are senseless to it and not interested, but you know, in nineteen ninety three at the anno fiftieth anniversary. There was an awful lot of coverage in the newspapers, and there was a special service in the in the cemetery for the dead. Um, and and to me, you know, we've got into this habit of 
uh, you know, in the military history world of assuming the, the bombing side, the, the aircraft, the squadrons and all of that, we've kind of forgotten the sheer volume of misery. And it's not just the misery on, on, the, on the victims. And this is going back to what Len Dighton was, I think, trying to address. You've not just got the victims of the air crew, you've got the victims on the ground and you've got all the families and the loved ones. And, <clears throat> and, and that's what comes out of every time you look at an air raid, you go through the same process. And at the end of all of that, Bomber Harris is twisting his words. And I still remember when I met him at um, RAF Hendon and he signed a, um, a print. I used to collect aircraft prints. And it was, I think it was a Dan Busters. And he said something, I gave it to my parents in the end. And it said so, I said to him, you know, do you have any regrets in the world? Absolutely not, Sonny. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, fine. Thank you very much. It's one of those things, I think, as 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 one gets older, one looks at more. Oh, some do, I suppose. For me, is maybe that's a, a lingering thing from Dighton, but nothing good comes of it. It's hell for everyone. And the the reasoning behind why those on the ground were, were taking what they were and, and those in the air were, as that poor Hamden crew, from there, possibly having quite horrible final moments. There's as you've articulated very well, I think the the chain of command that goes to it, there's more that they know than perhaps we're willing to admit. And I, that August report has really, really made me think that if they were making those statements then, considering what they then went on to do, that's quite remarkable. So I don't think anybody comes out of it very well because you get Solly, I think it's Solly Zuckerberg. He, he, he's the guy with the apes and study of, of the raiding and he suggests that they do the transportation attacks. Mm -hmm. um, he then writes the, the military study, the bombing survey. Um, you know, he's very critical of Harris. Um, but it, you know, it's all self-serving, all of this. And at no point have I found, apart from maybe Noble Franklin in his work doing the official history, that there was anybody getting anywhere near close to saying, well, actually, what did we do? How did we do it? Why did we do it? And what was the outcome? And as soon as you get close to the, the, the outcome, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the famous blue books that Harris go to the king but you see these diagrams you know and there's little Arkan and there's all the other cities and Arkan of course is in it because it's in A and B category cities and it's bombed all the time and you think you know the logic of that is was Arkan really an A, B city? I don't think it ever was but it suited hmm. The, the the operational research guys and the more I went in to look at the operational researchers as you know um, doing a, an MBA you you learn to have you have to learn operational or you used to have to learn operational research in theory and practice and as soon as an operational research report relies on words like probability or could be or might be or we don't know, so we assume, you know, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. and nearly every one of those operational research papers that are produced after the raids, and I've actually collected all of them, not just Arkans, um, it's all full of maybes, could bes, possiblys. And, you know, if you look at all those reports, the, re the reports are nonsense. And if you read, if Harris is true, and, and the problem is, is he? If he's true to his word, he's saying most of the time, the operational research, the operational research, the operational research. He's backing it up by saying, you know, we had this scientific element. And at some point, you have to question the scientific element and ask yourself, is the scientific element being used correctly for scientific analysis? 
or is it being used as a political excuse for a policy for some other sort? And initially, I was prepared to go down the route because I saw lots of mathematical equations and assuming that those mathematical equations were meaningful, although I never actually saw any of them being put into practice, but there they were, Lindemann giving out this, that and the other. If they were correct, then you would assume, right, it's going for scientific analysis. But because nearly all of the scientific analysis is is written into it on, based on assumptions and probabilities and blah blah blah, it's worthless. Any any operational researcher will tell you it's worthless. Now Fenneman, who was that famous Nobel Prize winner who buggered off to um, Massachusetts Institute for Industry, his big comment is. Operational research was great, except we got it wrong with the uh, upward firing machine guns on the German fighters. Well, if you look at the reports, they knew about that yep. because they were in, informing to all of the pilots that you have to corkscrew and this, that and the other. If they didn't know how the upward firing guns were affecting the raids, why were the pilots doing what they were doing? So even the operational research people themselves in their scientific analysis are not being fully honest with anybody. So it's it's justification being wrapped up in pseudo not pseudoscience, but within an official looking report. Yeah, because and you know, the same is happening with uh, RAF Fighter Command. Fighter Command is already telling the story of the Battle of Britain as its final historical piece, mm -hmm. so that when it ends in 1945, it won Britain. So that that historical narrative is already in place in 1943. That's clever thinking, yeah? That's very clever thinking. Harris realises... His has to be based on results. So they've got no results before 1944 when they capture Arkan. But once they capture Arkan, Arkan then becomes a 40-page study with masses of photographs and all, as I say, all of this stuff. But how you then justify what the bombers did as opposed to what the ground forces did, I don't know. Because if if the listener isn't aware, the battle for Arkin was nasty, to say the least. Well, they're all sending out bombs and shells all over the place. So mm. to say what had happened a year and a bit before, you can't really get down to the brass tacks of it. Yeah, and of course you've got those heavy raids mm. which add to the destruction at the end, which is all high explosive, um, and they're blowing up the city with high explosive because they assume that the fire now has destroyed all the wooden buildings from the medieval period. And then they tell you in the final report, which goes into the bombing mission, that Arkham's medieval character is still there. You can't, can't, can't have really? both sides of it. <laughs> well, that's a lot to think about. So, you know, I suppose if I was to conclude, my conclusion would be Len Dighton is not relevant anymore. If you really want to do this stuff, if you want to, if you want to look at a raid, take a raid apart and really analyse it, and um, and that's doable. If you live in London, you can go to Q, and they're all there. One final question, because we've we could go on even more, but I can hear dinner being cooked. Does the work that it takes to look at a single raid through the course of a period of time? Does, is that what puts off a lot of study? Because you, you, you tend to, we look at the bombing campaign as a whole. If you sort of think of that as the horizontal, is the data for individual elements and you know if we take as we've taken Arkin as an example, seeing that it does not does not correlate with the narrative just from the fact that it was as you said was considered destroyed and yet they continued going back for. Um, for other reasons. Is it because that's a lot of work to look at a single target as opposed to looking at, say, overall production figures versus tonnage drop? 
Uh, yeah, I guess because if you're Mr. Hastings, all you have to do is to look at a couple of official histories. And I think it's the first two big files of the bombing campaign, which give you the whole story. Um, and it's all fairly well mapped out and easy to write. And of course, one raid that everybody writes about is the Dam Busters. Um, and, you know, I've said, I said on Woody's um, program, uh, words to the effect that uh, I didn't think it was on its own, on its own. I didn't think the, the raid was genocidal. Um, but if you ask me in terms of the context of everything that's going on, I don't see much difference in the raids on mm. the dams from the raids on the forests. And so if you look at it in terms of what's actually happening in progression, the progression to extreme violence is, you know, extraordinary. And that's the point. See, that's the same with what's going on with the war in Ukraine. Violence escalates to fill itself. And now I'm saying that in the form of a... Of I suppose, in a sense, a Marxist dialectic that you build and 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 it will continue. And well, that's actually what happens with violence. Because you go from a point of intimidation to the first punch, to the second punch, to boots, to, you know, and then it sticks and then it's stones and then it's guns and or knives and then it's guns and then it's, air, you know, and, off, and, and, on and on and on and on. It never stops. Once you're on the treadmill of violence, extreme violence, it only gets worse. Now, that's exactly the same with Monty on the ground. He doesn't give a flying fig for any civilians in the way. But the problem with that situation, the, the problem with comparing that with the bombers is he's got collateral damage in front of him. So as, a, as an army, he is fighting to defeat the Germans and the civilians become collateral damage swept up in the overall war. It, they're not the target. The problem with the, with the bombing is since the 13th of May 1940, civilians have been the target. And it's become increasingly deliberate to mass kill civilians now this idea that you can dehouse them what the hell does that mean it's a euphemism is it of course it is yeah it's not just blowing the roofs off if you were only blowing the roofs off you drop little hand grenade bombs all over the place and the rooms would be gone and then they wouldn't be able to live in those rooms anymore well that's dehousing but they aren't doing that they're blowing the roofs off and then dropping incendiaries to make sure that everything and everybody is burnt and which is why so many people die in the cellars because they've died of asphyxiation and it's entire families, granddad, grandma, wifey, two children. Some of the graves, some of the German graves, because they, they gave them military graves because they declared they were all war casualties. Some of those little crosses have as many as 10 names on them. It's an entire family completely wiped out, disappeared. And, you know, in Dresden, when you, you know, when you're looking at the, the destruction of Dresden, you, you know, one, there's no wonder why so many people disappear. And it's the same in Hamburg. Um, there's no protection. And they know there's no protection, hence why they do what they do. But it's only started as they've got to a certain stage, which is, now, now whether that's because Stalingrad and Al Alamein has decided that there's a turnaround effect and, and they're not going to be defeated and they're not going to be put up against the wall and shot, there's another factor. If you can get away with it, you will do it. As Putin knows, he at the moment can get away with grievous crimes because he knows nobody is going to take him to the courts yet. And the Russians, Brigozin and the rest of them, they will do what they do because they think they are 
invincible and can escape justice. Nazis thought the same. To a certain extent, Harris got away. But I think, you know, in the end, the British people didn't go up and, up, you know, have an uprising to say that the Royal Air Force Bomber Command should have medals. And that's the, that, that the electorate didn't say spontaneously, you know, this is all wrong. There was this general feeling, I think, that they did a dirty job. We admire them for doing the dirty job. But there's no medal. And I think it's, it's sad. I mean, my great uncle was a, was a bomber pilot from 1940, trained at Ringway when the war started, right the way through to the end, flew multiple missions. A very, very kindly man. Hated every minute of what he'd done and re flatly refused to talk about it. Um, but again, you know, he the, there was another side to him and his son grew up somewhat, not deranged, but not quite in, as, he, as well as he could have been. He was not well looked after. Um, Michael Fallon was a squadron leader in the end, uh, having started as a flight sergeant. And he was just, he was not good company. And, you know, you see the same happening with a lot of the, the guys who went into Belson. Um, I know a, a the, the, the daughter of a sergeant major. And when, when he discovered that she was writing with her left hand, he forced her to write with her right. Uh, and it was purely down to protection. He didn't want her being isolated as a bad child to end up in a camp like that. He was completely, he was completely, you know, gone with it because what he saw was so extreme, he, he didn't want it to happen to his daughter and that led him to behave in a, another way. And I think there's an awful lot of that. And you, you see it in, you know, when, when you follow the families from the fallen, there are those who really desperately want to know what's going on and are really proud of their sons and others, there's numbers of graves without any comment. And and the 20, 21 year olds and they're abandoned. Grief is a terrible thing and some people find it easier to shut it off. Yeah, yeah and I think that's and, and I think it's very important why I you know, I go back to this, you know, what are we remembering? Mm -hmm. Um and that, you know, that's become increasingly of concern to me because, you know, I had lots of family who walked past the cenotaph some very brave men in the family and women. Um, but what were we remembering in the end? And I, I, and it kind of concerns me because as one side, Britain stands up to Nazism and does this great thing. But then on the other hand, does some rather unpleasant things. And, and this is one of them, the bombing. I hope you're still with us because that was a very in-depth and deep discussion of the bombing war. And we would love your feedback and get your feelings on the many topics we've discussed over the last few hours of this podcast. Now, I'm a big fan of Phil's work, and the thing I like about it is that he challenges me to think in different ways about things that I've taken as wrote. And as you can imagine, when we get together over a beer, things get deep really, really quickly. Ask my wife after our visiting of, of him and his dear other half in Aachen last summer. For further reading, I cannot recommend Phil's book, Birds of Prey, highly enough. It is a remarkable investigation into Hitler's Luftwaffe and their culpability in the Holocaust in Poland. We covered this in History Hack Days on Hedge Hopping. We did two parts about it then. I've put the book on the Damcasters bookshop, so if you're in the UK or Europe, you can pick it up from there, and 10% of that supports the pod and supports Phil's work. That is a fascinating look going down to GIS level data of what exactly was happening in the forests of East Prussia and the greater German state. Phil will be back on this podcast and we do have our long discussed chat about the strategic bombing survey, which we mentioned in the pod. I'd love to get your feedback on this. Every once in a while, we will be doing these long pods that we don't break up to give us time to really delve into a subject. And we know this one is going to generate some comments. We'd love to hear them. We'd like to get your feelings on them and basically further this discussion in any way that we can. As always, thank you so much for your support of the podcast. And we hope after this massive one, we haven't put you off. Please do tell your friends. The best way you can support the pod is by 
leaving us a review in your podcast app of choice. Pop some stars in. It helps the algorithm, especially on Apple Podcasts, where we do keep popping up quite heavily in the aviation charts here in the UK. So thank you so much for that. If you'd like to hear these pods without ads, then of course there's the Patreon. That's from £3 a month, plus a bit of that. No times are tough, so that is only there if you feel that you can't put up with the odd Acast insert at the beginning, middle, and end of the show. In the meantime, thank you so much for your support of the pod. We hope you found the last few hours of discussion interesting. Like I said, and I'm going to say this again, please let us know what you think, as both Phil and I will be looking at the comments, and we'll be responding to them as we can. Next week, it's going to be a shorter one. Lots of noise, I think, in that one as we head up to the British Classic Jets collection to talk to the guys there as they fire up some of the best British jets of the Cold War period. So that's basically noise and me talking to a few people. Until then, thanks again for your support and do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcasts and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.